Hey guys, Hacker Exploit here, and in this video, we're gonna get started with the web application penetration testing series. All right, so a lot of you guys have been asking for this, uh, mostly because you want to learn the art of bug bounty, and uh, here is the series. So I've worked really, really hard on uh, you know making it as comprehensive as possible. We're gonna get started with setting up Burp Suite. So for those of you who don't know what Burp Suite is, Burp Suite is essentially an integrated platform uh, for performing security testing of web applications. All right, so the first thing you need to understand is that it will, it will allow us to intercept the data being sent between your browser and the web application. So it's uh, it's a great way of understanding how data is being transferred and how data can be, manipul be manipulated uh, between the client uh, and obviously uh, the web application. Okay, so the tool we're going to be using, as I said, is Burp Suite, and uh, I'm currently running ParrotOS. So don't worry if, if you're running Windows or Kali Linux, it doesn't really matter. All you need to do is just download and install Burp Suite. It's pretty simple to get set up. You don't have to register. You just download the free community version. Now, obviously, down the line, uh, you might choose to uh, to buy the professional version, which I do recommend and I have used, uh, but I I don't use it as often. I'm not, uh, you know, um, specifically a web penetrator tester I'm more of a um, I'm more of an of a web uh, server uh, penetration tester so uh, I really work uh, with a different uh, vector so uh, by default you can choose to bite that's once you become experienced and uh, you know you've chosen whether this is uh, the path that you want to pursue it's a fantastic path I know a lot of people who you know make good money with bug bounty so uh, you know it's something that you can look into as well all right so let's get started with setting up the proxy uh, all right, so this is the intercepting proxy that allows us to obviously to intercept the data being sent uh, to and from the client uh, and the uh, the web the web application. So to do that, we need we can just do it through Firefox. So the browser I'll be using is Firefox. You can use whatever you want, and by default you want to go into your preferences that can be found here. Preferences, there we are, and uh, you want to go all the way into uh, the bottom here that way it has the network proxy, and make sure you go into settings. And you want to go into manual proxy configuration. All right. So this is where we're going to configure it uh, to be the local host with the port set uh, at 8080. All right. And then you want to make sure that the ser you use the server proxy for all pro protocols. So that is the proxy we're going to be using and just hit OK. All right. And once that's done, you should be good there. Now you, what you want to do is just open up Burp Suite so you can search for it or I have it uh, already on my uh, on my little taskbar here. And I don't think I've updated it for a while, so I'll probably need to do that later. But for now, I'll just close the, the update prompt and it's going to prompt you. Welcome to Burp Suite. And it's going to say, uh, now not depending on the version that you've chosen to select, whether you've chosen the community version, which is what I have here, or the free version as it's called, and you then have the pro version. So uh, by default, the community version uh, only allows you to use a temporary project. Uh, if you have the professional version, it allows you to save your project, which is, uh, you know, great functionality as well. So just hit next and you just want to hit use the burp defaults and just hit start burp and just give that a few seconds to start it up. All right. And I'll explain the interface generally, but we'll be looking more into how burp works in the next video. I just want to get you set up with burp in this video and uh, you understand what exactly is going on. All right. So welcome to burp. Now, by default, uh, again, it may seem a little bit intimidating, mostly because if you're a beginner, you have not heard of any of these of these words here and you don't really know what uh, they're doing. All right. So by default, you have your target proxy, spider scanner, intruder, repeater, sequencer, decoder, comparer, extender, your project options, your user options and alerts. We'll be going through all of this as we uh, as we, you know, perform real world testing on our um on our vulnerable uh, on our vulnerable target, I'll be showing you how to set up a damn vulnerable web application soon and uh, many others. But for now, just focus on Burp Suite. All right. So uh, by default, you want to just uh, go into proxy. All right. And for some reason, I already have some data here. Uh, so you know what? I'm just going to leave that as it is. Uh, I just want to turn our intercept off. So we are not intercepting any traffic as of yet. And you want to go uh, into your options. And you want to make sure that your proxy listeners, uh, as you can see, Burp proxy uses listeners to receive incoming HTTP requests from your browser. So you want to make sure that your proxy is set as the, uh, as the one we set in Firefox, which is the local host 127.0.0.1 and the port is 8080 and make sure that that is running. 
All right, you can also create your own and add it here and you can also remove it so you get the idea. Now by default, uh, if I just go back to my intercept, if I just go back to my browser, and this is where the real magic happens. If I just, uh, you know, if I just open this and I type in a simple test site example.com and I just hit enter, all right, it's going to load it up here. But if we go into burp suite uh, and I go into HTTP history, you can see that by default, uh, there are some uh, Firefox portals, uh, you know, some get methods here, but we'll be looking at all of these methods or requests. By default, you can see that the example.com, uh, the example.com, uh, URL that we entered, uh, you can see there is a get request and furthermore, if you go down to the bottom here, you can see there is some more information regarding uh, what a request was sent to the web application. Uh, or uh, So by default, you can see that um, the host was example.com and it gives you more information uh, like the accept language, the encoding, uh, the connection. And uh, if you look at the headers, you can see that the uh, the header uh, shows, uh, you know, very, very clearly you, you have your get host uh, use agent accept uh, language, the accept encoding connection, etc, etc. So you might be a little bit confused if this is your first time hearing about, uh, you know, headers uh, and the request and response pairs. But don't worry about that. We'll get through all of this. Uh, for now, if I just go back into intercept and um, let me just open up my browser here and we open something like uh, the my web my website, which is hsploit.com. Uh, so before we do that, I just want to hit intercept on. All right. So now it's going to intercept actively and uh, we're just going to hsploit.com and I hit go. All right. Now, by default, it's going to tell me that uh, uh, essentially that there, my connection is not secure. Don't worry about this. Just uh, go into your uh, and just add this as an exception. There we are. I'm going to hit confirm exception. And uh, now it's still not going to load the website. And the reason being is we have not forwarded uh, the request uh, and they are being intercepted by Burp Suite. All right. So if I go into back into Burp Suite, you can see that uh, it has started the intercept process. And uh, by default, you can see that uh, we need to forward. Uh, we need to forward the uh, the request here. So if I just forward it. Uh, let me just forward that again. There we are. Let me just forward them for hack exploit. There we are. That's the correct one. So I'll forward this again. And uh, there we are. So now hack exploit should be up and running. And as you can see, uh, it should have loaded the site. Give that a few seconds. There we are. All right. So as you can see, that is how you intercept uh, the data that is being sent from uh, the client to the web application. And uh, furthermore, that's how you you can analyze the data being sent and furthermore manipulate it to obviously find vulnerabilities within the web application. All right, so irregardless of all of this, I know this was very, very basic and it's not really covered anything in terms of web application penetration testing, but don't worry about that. Uh, you know, we start off uh, really, really simple and we build on that. We're going to get started with spidering, more specifically spidering uh, with Burp Suite. And uh, you know, the purpose of this video or this tutorial is to help you understand the spidering process and uh, how to go about doing it with a Burp Suite. All right. So there's going to be a little bit of theory here, but I'll be explaining a lot of uh, things. So again, this video is really focused on understanding spidering. Now, before you get started with that, uh, I just wanted to let you know that the target or our web application that we're going to be targeting um, or we're going to be attacking is the damn vulnerable web application. Now, if you don't know what the damn vulnerable web application is, that's fine. You can just Google it and I'll probably make a video on how to get it installed on Kali Linux. But what I would recommend if you're a you know, beginner or even if you're a professional in hacking, probably one of the best things that you need to have, uh, you know, in your kit is Metasploitable 2. All right. And for the simple reason that it contains uh, first of and foremost, a vulnerable operating system. And secondly, it contains all the vulnerable web applications that we will be using at one stage uh, during this series. OK, so we're going to be starting off with the damn vulnerable web application. As I said, it comes pre-installed with Metasploitable 2. So all you need to do is get the local IP address on your Metasploitable 2 virtual machine, which in my case is 192.168.1.102. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my browser and I'm just going to open up that web, uh, that IP address 0.1.102 and uh, just give it a few seconds to load up. As you can see, there we are. That's Metasploitable 2. And uh, it's going to prompt us to select what vulnerable web app we want to use. In this case, we're going to select the DVWA, which is the damn vulnerable web application. So just click on that. And now it's going to ask you 
for your admin and password. Uh, in this case, uh, for your username and password, sorry about that. In this case, the username is admin and the password is uh, password. All right, so just hit login and it's going to log you into the uh, damn vulnerable web application. Now we'll be looking at this uh, at a more uh, in, in at a later video. And the reason is we have to go through all of these options. But for now, if you go to the um, if I can just remember where it was, if I can just go to the security. So to the damn vulnerable web application security at the moment, it was high because I was actually uh, performing some tests on it. But just change it to medium or low. But for now, you won't be using it. I was just letting you know what web application we're going to be using. All right. That being said, let's move on to Burp Suite. All right. And uh, we can I can start explaining the spidering process. All right. So let me just open up Burp Suite. So I've updated it to the latest version. I think I'm running Catalyst next now in the previous video. I was running Parrot. Uh, so I think there should be an update, but uh, I could be wrong. So let's just give that a few seconds to start up. Yeah, there is an update. So I'll do that later. And we'll just click on create our temporary project and use the burp defaults and start burp. Okay, so whilst that's starting, let me explain what spidering is. All right, now the purpose of spidering is to identify our scope, all right, or what uh, what we want to scan. Now, this is not exactly scanning, and we'll be looking at scanning, but essentially, spidering is the process of mapping out our web application and is very, very useful for finding uh, links and uh, and web forms. Uh, which is also very important because it will allow us to then furthermore uh, attack the web forms, manipulate headers, etc., etc. All right. Now, when you talk about automatic spidering with Burp Suite, it's essentially when uh, when Burp is spidering, it follows uh, links and uh, it'll, it'll it'll start following links and it will start uh, identifying full files, folders, and forms from the web application. And it will uh, the the great thing about this is it will record all the requests and responses while it's performing the, the whole spidering process. Okay, so uh, once you have a burp suite opened up here, you can let me just expand it so we have a greater picture of what's going on exactly. Sorry if my virtual machine is a little bit slow. I need to configure it correctly. Anyway, what you want to do is we've looked at the proxy section. Let's look at the spider section. And in here, uh, this is a very, very simple menu. And to understand it, you can see that we have two tabs available. We have the control tab and we have the options tab. All right. The control tab, uh, essentially, if I just click, if I just look, if we look at it, as you can see, these settings are used to monitor and control the burp spider. So it allows you to stop, uh, to start and stop the burp spidering. Uh, and you can also clear the queues. All right. When you look at the options, which is right here. Sorry about that. When you look at the options, there are a lot of options. We'll be looking at them in, we'll be looking at them in a second. Sorry about that. Uh, I actually got an email. Apologies there. Um, let's get started now with the control section. So, uh, the control section, it allows, we, we are able to control the spider status where we can stop it and start it. And, uh, you know, furthermore, we can uh, clear the queues that already exist there. All right. Um, we then have the spider scope where we can uh, we can define our own uh, scope uh, and depending on what we want to spider. We'll look at that in a few seconds. Uh, and finally, if we look at the uh, well, if we look in the options section here, we have the crawler settings, which allow us to specify uh, the way the spider is going to crawl for the web content on the web application. We'll be looking at the maximum link depth and what that means, passive spidering. That allows us to essentially spider to con continue spidering when we are looking through uh, or we're going through the web application or we're performing uh, requests and responses uh, when we're performing requests. As for the form submission, this is probably something that we'll be looking at in the next video and we'll be doing this uh, practically where we'll be actually performing the uh, we'll be performing the spidering process. Uh, but for now, let me see what else. Yes, the request headers. Uh, the request headers are used to, uh, you can manipulate essentially the headers. Uh, if you have learned about HTTP headers, by the way, I really want to cover HTTP because it's very important that you understand how the headers work, but we'll be looking at this all in advance. But now let's start off with the spider status. Uh, well, not really with the spider status, but looking at the control tab, uh, if you look at the spider scope, you can see that you can, it'll use the default suite scope, which is defined in the target tab. If you just click on use a custom scope, you can see that, okay, first, uh, you, if, if you just click on this little cog here, you can restore the defaults, you can load your own and you can save the options. So that's just uh, to do with that. Now, when you talk about using the advanced scope, here is where you can uh, essentially, um, this is where you specify 
what you want to uh, map. So you can specify a host, uh, the port, etc., etc. Okay, again, we'll be looking at all of this as we move along. But for now, we're just going to use the default suite scope. Um, we can just, uh, if once you click on that, it's going to start the, the spidering process, but we don't need it right now. So I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to pause it. And if we mo move on to the options now, the options tab has a lot of stuff that we need to look into. First and foremost, we have the, cro the crawler settings, all right? So, uh, when we're talking about the basic options, so for example, we can specify what, uh, the spider will crawl for. Uh, so it, it, you can choose to select for robot, the robots.txt file, which is very important because it shows you, uh, you know, exclusions. You then, uh, can detect, you can ignore the links to non-text, uh, content. Uh, you can request the root of all directories. Very important stuff. But again, you can customize this to your liking. Now, one of the things I would recommend that you do not touch with if you do not know what you're doing yet is the maximum link depth. All right. The maximum link depth is essentially, uh, the number of links you want the spider to, uh, to essentially uh, to crawl or to, to map. Now, by default, five is uh, in my, in my, in my situation or in my case, uh, what I like doing is alternating between three to five. Anything higher than that uh, will usually overload uh, the web application and it will cause it to lag or to respond very, very slowly. And, uh, you know, again, th that might not mean a lot right now, but trust me, when you'll actually be performing the penetration test on the web application, you really need a, a good response. Uh, otherwise you, you have your time to live, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's look at what passive spidering is, all right? So passive spidering, as I said, is essentially just, uh, it allows you to continue scanning, uh, you know, or, or going through, uh, or actually performing your requests how, as, uh, as it, um, it, it essentially allows you to continue the spidering process as you're performing any other tasks. So as you can see, passive spidering monitors, um, monitors traffic through the burp proxy to update the sitemap without making any new requests, all right? So, passively spied as you browse. You can also select the link depth associated with proxy requests. Now this, I would recommend keeping it at zero to two. And that's because again, you do not want a very, very deep uh, link depth in the sense that you're also going to be performing your own uh, requests and you'll be doing many other things. You could be uh, looking at the decoder or you could be looking at, you know, could be focusing on the target and you don't want it again to, uh, to slow down the web application. All right. So form submission, again, this is something that I said we'll be talking about in the, in the next video because it is quite advanced uh, and we'll get started with the damn vulnerable web application there. Uh, moving on to the spider engine, we'll be looking at application login as well. But for now, uh, just uh, we will just skip over that when we talk about the spider engine. All right. These uh, settings uh, control the engine used for making HTTP uh, requests when spidering. All right. So this allows you to change the number of threads you want to use. And as I said, uh, using more than, um, we can see right now it's at 10. What I would recommend is still keeping it within the range of uh, two to five, uh, or you might, uh, you might cause the web application to slow down. And these are uh, more advanced settings that you can use uh, dependent on timing. All right. And we've talked about the request headers. They allow you to modify the way the spider will, uh, will look. Uh, towards the web application. So, for example, you could you could edit uh, the the uh, the device that is being used, and you could change it, for example, into a mobile device, and you get the idea. You are you essentially allows you to to change the request headers, um, and uh, from that, obviously, you'll get a response back, uh, dependent on what you changed. All right. So that was the spidering, uh, or actually the theory uh, revolving around spidering. Now uh, we'll be looking at how spidering really works in the next video. Uh, I know some of you may not like this, that I actually went through theory and I haven't uh, talked about doing anything. But remember, it's very, very important to understand what exactly is happening behind spidering. And in the next video, we'll actually get started with the spidering process. I'm going to get started with brute forcing with BEP. All right, so our uh, vulnerable web application of choice is going to be the damn vulnerable web application, as we discussed in the previous video. All right, and I'm going to be using Metasploitable 2 as our as my server. By default, you can install Metas uh, you can install the damn vulnerable web application on your Kali Linux, and you can host it on your local uh, on your local server. And you can, uh, you can then uh, perform your attacks. Uh, but I like running it from an, another virtual machine. And as you can see, I'm running it on the Metasploitable 2 virtual machine. And uh, by default, it's connected to my local network and it's bridged. So you can see that my local IP address is 192.168.1.102. 
All right, so I already have uh, the damn vulnerable web application open. As you can see, it is running on the, that IP address of the Metasploitable 2 virtual machine uh, under the damn vulnerable web application. So for those of you asking why I'm using uh, Metasploitable 2 instead of Metasploitable 3, it's because Metasploitable 2 has a, a much larger choice in terms of vulnerable web applications, and it's really good for practicing. All right, so make sure you're logged into your damn vulnerable web application. You need the, the default username is admin and the password is password. All right, it's really very simple. All right, by default in this video, we're going to set our security level to low. If you don't know how to do that, you can go into your damn vulnerable web application security and you can set that to low and you can just hit submit. The reason we're setting it to low is because most uh, logins are, you know, if you look at the real world, if you're talking about big sites, this attack may very well work on sites that are older or sites that have not been updated or sites that don't have good security. You'll be shocked to find some really big companies that are actually don't have any login protection or brute force protection for that matter. Now, that being said, what I was talking about is if we go into brute force, you can see that we have a login prompt here. Now, I've forgotten the username and password and we're going to be brute forcing it live. All right. But before we do that, we need to actually start our burp. All right. So start a burp suite and you can see I'm using the community edition and it is the latest version. All right. So make sure that yours is the latest version, obviously, for obvious reasons. And we're just going to start a temporary project because I don't use the pro version. And we're going to hit use the burp defaults. We're going to start burp. All right. Give that a few seconds to start the uh, to start up and now you want to make sure you uh, you're using the proxy so we're going to go into preferences and advanced and uh whoops uh burp is opened up let me just go into my proxies network settings and we we'll make sure that it's using the manual proxy configuration which is the local host 127.0.0.1 and the port is 8080 we're going to hit okay excellent now we need to move into burp back again and we want to make sure that we go into proxy and the intercept is set to off. All right. The reason we're setting the intercept off is because I just want to show you something first. Now, by default, intercept essentially just means that you're not intercepting the request, uh, the requests and the responses being sent from the web application to your browser. OK, so we, the, we have already set the proxy for the browser, but we're not intercepting. So uh, if we just test a, a random username like test and we say a password like one, two, three, four, five, you can see if I hit login, it's going to tell me that that is incorrect. Now, if I set the intercept to on to see the request, let me just turn it to on and we can now reload this. So we can say test and the password one, two, three, four, five. We can see that uh, now it's uh, for some reason. Let me just forward that. Uh, I have to actually just turn that off and we now say log in. And for some reason that is not allowing us because we have to reload. All right. So now if I hit intercept on, and uh, whoops, let me just open up my browser and I hit the password one, three, four, five, log in. For some reason, it's uh, going to, you know, it's going to, it's a little reloading here. Uh, I probably, there we are. All right. So I've reloaded the page. And as you can see now, the intercept is on. And if we go back to burp, uh, you can see that we got the get request being sent by the web application. Now let's inspect it for a while. Now we'll be looking at what all of this really means. But by, uh, by default, the most important thing right now is the get request. All right. So you can see that the get request has two values here. It has the username and the and the password. Now the, the values are, again are not important. We're going to be brute forcing the values, but it's very important to get the fields that we're using here. Now, what am I talking about here? If you look at the cookie, you can see the security is low. And if you are to edit the value and forward the package, you can set it to high. That is basic stuff. That's kids stuff, right? But now we want to brute force this login. All right. And how do we do that? You can see uh, the first thing we need to do is we're going to be using the intruder. All right. So if you're a bit confused about what the intruder is, don't be worried. The intruder is, uh, essentially allow, uh, allows us to edit the parameters. It allows us to edit the requests and then uh, obviously edit them and manipulate them so we can get the desired re results. Now, the great thing about the, uh, the intruder is it allows us to perform attacks like the brute force, etc., etc. All right. But now what we need to do is we need to send this request into the intruder so that we can send our own response. All right. So we're going to right click and send to intruder. So we just send it to intruder. And once it's sent to the intruder, you can just hit forward. All right. We don't need we, do, we don't need that get request anymore. So now you want to go into the intruder and you want to go into your uh, positions. And as you can see in your positions, you have got you have got uh, the get re request that we were we, we had just intercepted. And now you can see something really interesting. It's highlighted for you all the different payloads. 
okay, uh, or the different fields that we can brute force for. By default, we have the username value, the password value, the login value. We have the F, uh, the SFID value. We have the uh, the cookie value. No, no, no. We don't need all of these. The only values that we need are the username and the password value. So the most important thing you need to do right now is you need to clear. Just hit clear. All right. Uh, oops. Sorry. Not that clear. I, I beg. Uh, I know. I beg your apology there. Uh, I. Sorry. Uh, I didn't mean that. What I'm trying to say is I'm sorry. Just clear. Just hit clear. And as you can see now, no values are being selected to be brute forced against. So now we need to select them manually. But before that, we're going to be using the uh, the cluster bomb attack type. All right. The reason we're using the cluster bomb attack type is because we are going to be using two values. We are brute forcing against two values. Remember that. Okay, and these need to be set in uh, in combinations. So that means it's much better to use a cluster bomb because uh, essentially you're clustering two values that need to be uh, that need to be tested against the login uh, the login application uh, or the login form together. All right, so in a combination. So we need to select cluster bomb, and now we need to select the values because those are the those are that is what we want to brute force again. So just highlight the value. Uh, it doesn't matter what the password or the username is, just highlight it and you want to hit add. All right. So just hit add. And as you can see, we have selected that. You now want to go into the password and you want to highlight that as well. And you just want to add that. As you can see now, once we have added that, those are the two values we're going to be brute forcing against. Make sure that none of the others are selected, none of the other values. Once that is done, you're, you're almost there now. Now you want to go into your payloads. All right. Now in your payloads, you want to make sure that your payload set is set to two, which is your username and your password. So let's start off with your payload set as payload one. All right. As your payload uh, type, make sure that that is a simple list because you can see we're only targeting usernames and passwords. So we don't need, uh, you know, a runtime file or we are not changing anything, uh, you know, dependent on Unicode, etc. You get the idea. Okay, so simple list, and now you go into your payload options, which is where you select your user list or your password list or your word list. Now, we are not using a word list, but if you want to, you can, if you're performing this on a real site, which I don't recommend unless you have written permission. Now, since we're using this in our penetration testing lab, we are going to just add the default usernames. As I said, the security of the site is low, and it's not really a complex a brute force to crack. Okay. So what we want to do is we, uh, we want to make sure we have set payload set to one, which is going to be for our usernames. So now we can go into load where you can load your default uh, usernames and your passwords or your word lists. But by default, we're going to add our own. All right. So we're going to say, uh, whoops, we, we, for some, we're just going to say uh, we're going to type in and now like the commonly used usernames. All right. So something like admin. Uh, administrator, whoops, for some reason, uh, actually, let, let me just remove these uh, blank values there. Admin, now administrator, administrator, let me just type that back in. Administrator, uh, like so, administrator, for those of you telling me that my typing is bad, that's because my microphone is right in front of me and I can't really see what I'm typing. Administrator, uh, let's see what else, what are the default ones, like we have root, um, we have password. Uh, actually, we're not setting the passwords right now, so we can just type in the default ones like this. All right, so we can say test, you know, the default ones, user one, whatever you think could be the most commonly used ones are okay. Or if you know what the username is, that is even better. So we're going to add all the usernames. All right, so we've added the usernames that we want to use. Now, by default, again, I'm saying you can use a word list if you want to, just go into load and select the word list. Now we want to select our passwords. All right. So we can go into the payload set two. And as you can see, now we can add our own values. Now we can use the default word list that come with Kali Linux. So if I go into my root uh, and I go into user share and we select word lists, uh, let me just find where word lists are. If I can find them, there we are word lists. And uh, the, the, the ones that work great for me are in the Metasploit folder. And you can look for the default uh, passwords. As you can see, you have your database default passwords. You have your default uh, user passwords for services. That's also great. It has a great list of, uh, of default usernames and passwords that you can use. But for me, I'm not going to use this because we are sticking to the basics now. Now you want to add your own password. So we can select again some randomly, uh, you know, commonly used passwords. So pass, uh, you can say password. Um, let's see what else admin, you know, admin again. Uh, whoops, let me just remove that one. Admin, uh, root, you can use root. Uh, let's see, let me think one, two, three, four, five. That's also one that I've seen many network administrators using one, two, three, four, five. And you, you get the idea. 
Alright, so we've set our two payloads. Payload 1 is set for usernames, payload 2 is set for passwords. Excellent. Alright, now uh, we've selected our payload types, we've selected, uh, we've added our payload options. We don't need to look at payload processing, that is advanced. Once that's done, what you want to do is go into intruder and start the attack. All right, and now it's going to tell you that the community edition of Burp contains a demo version, but it's, it's essentially telling you that the process is going to be slow. All right, so we're going to hit OK, and it's going to start the attack. As you can see, it's going through all the combinations, and as you can see, there are combinations that we have here are 25, and it's going to go through all of them. Now, one great thing that you need to do here, or one important thing that you need to do is you need to understand the, uh, the, the status codes that the server or the web application is sending back. Now, that's a good way of in, of understanding um, what password is correct and what uh, what uh, username is correct and what password is not correct. Okay, so uh, if we look now at the uh, at, at the results, as you can see that it's finished, it's gone through the brute force attack. We check the status. The status is still the same. We have a status to two hundred. If we look at the length, all right, the length is going to be still the same. But you you have to look for things that are not uh, that are not matching. So, for example, you can see that uh, the length here that was returned was forty nine forty eight, and it's not uh, it's not following the format of the others. So that means that this could be the username and password. Uh, don't worry about the status. The status will still remain the same, uh, irregardless of that. But when we'll be looking at advanced server penetration testing, that's something important. So you can see that the get uh, that we've got here is very important. Now, if we look at the, uh, if we look at the response that will be sent, uh, right there, you can see the the response. And if we render it, you can see that if it was successful, it will tell us that we've logged in successfully. So let me just browse down all the way. As you can see, welcome to the password protected error admin. And there you go. That is the username and the password. It is admin and password. Now again, this was really simple. Again, you can, you can increase the security if you're practicing on your own, but you can see that this really works. And this is how to utilize burp for advanced stuff like brute forcing. Now again, most uh, of the advanced we websites nowadays have great content management systems that have the security plugins that essentially prevent you from brute forcing or lock you out. But most of the older sites, you'll be you'll be actually sh quite shocked to find out that uh, their brute forces, uh, the, their login forms, sorry, are not protected. Now we have already logged in, and we can see that the default username is admin, and the password is password. Okay, so you can look at the raw. Uh, the raw HTTP here, you can look at the request and the response. Um, uh, you can look at them and you can inspect them if that's what you do. And you can look at the headers, what's being sent, all that good stuff. But that was going to be it for this video. And now if we just go back into burp, uh, let me just go into my proxy and I'm going to in, uh, disable intercept and we can try and log in here. So we know that the admin, the username is admin and the password is password. So let me log in and welcome to the password protected admin area. Fantastic. In this video, we're going to be looking at selecting our burp suite, our target in burp suite, uh, adding it to, to our scope, and then finally spidering it. Uh, as my vulnerable operating system, I'm going to be using uh, the uh, Matilda, which comes pre-installed on Metasploitable 2. So uh, you should download, well, I would recommend that you download Metasploitable 2. It's a fantastic option for any of you who are just getting into penetration testing and offers multiple vulnerable uh, web applications and vulnerable systems that you can practice with. So again, it's something that I really, really recommend. Uh, that being said, uh, as you can see, I have uh, the Metasploitable 2 virtual machine running and uh, I have already looked at my local IP address. You can do that by uh, typing in ifconfig that will display to you uh, the, your, your current uh, network interface and your local IP address uh, because we are doing this in our virtual penetration testing uh, lab. Uh, all right, so let's go back to Kali Linux now, and uh, I'm going to open up my browser. Make sure you get your IP address. And as I said, again, we're going to be using Motilide. So if you don't know what Motilide is, Motilide is simply a vulnerable web application. And the reason I'm switching off, uh, I'm switching from the damn vulnerable web application is because I want to show you a few, I really want to make it a bit diverse in terms of uh, the web applications that we use. All right, so uh, let's get started now. Now I already have the IP address of my virtual machine opened up here in my browser. As you can see, 192.168.1.104. So if I re reload this, you can see that it indeed is the Metasploitable 2 server. And uh, um, I can just go ahead and click on Motility Day. All right, now what uh, I should do now is go into my preferences. You can do that by uh, opening a new tab. 
Uh, so let me just open a new tab here, going into preferences and then selecting advanced and network and finally settings. And then you want to make sure you select a manual proxy configuration and then make sure it's using the localhost proxy, which is 127.0.0.1, a port 8080 and hit OK. Once that's done, we know that Burp Suite can intercept. Not that we want to do that in this video. We just want to, uh, we want to have a look uh, at, we want to map the web, the web application. All right. So we're not going to change anything, uh, in Motility Day, but I'm going to be showing you some, uh, pretty interesting things in this video. So, um, uh, now we should start up Burp Suite community. Now I'm going to be explaining something at the end of the video that is uh, really important and it is in regards to the community version and the professional version of Burp Suite and what uh, what the differences are and uh, why you will need at some point to get the professional version. Okay, so uh, I'm going to select a temporary project. I'm using the community version as of right now. Hit next. Use the Burp defaults and I'm going to start Burp. All right, so it's going to start Burp Suite. And let me just minimize the browser here. So give that a few seconds to start up. And once it starts up, uh, what you want to do immediately is turn off the proxy. We want to stop uh, in the intercepting uh, because we are not intercepting any uh, requests um, or we are not intercepting any responses. Uh, so go back into your target. And uh, now we can get started with uh, with actually reloading the page right here. So let's reload that and uh, we should be able to see what's going on and we should have um, the site map. All right. So let me just open up uh, the burp suite here. Fantastic. All right. So now you can see something very interesting has happened here in our target and site map. We have uh, the files that were discovered here. Well, essentially, we have the web server that then has the Motility Day folder, which is our target. Now, before I get into any of that, the sitemap will show you the current sitemap. Obviously, a sitemap is essentially, sorry about that, a site sitemap is essentially the structure or, or the format of the web page and how the web page was constructed and how it will function uh, in regards to every other piece of content. Okay. So the first thing that we need to do or we'll be looking at is actually selecting our target, which in this case, again, is Motility Day. And you can do that by right clicking and hitting add to scope. All right. So you might be asking, what exactly does scope mean? Well, a scope essentially allows us to define uh, our automated spidering. And what this means is we are focusing our only on our target. We're not going to focus on the reference links like you can see here. For example, we have Twitter as a reference link, Backtrack, uh, Dynamic Drive, Eclipse, etc., etc. You get the idea. So scoping is essentially selecting our target, isolating it so that we only see what we need to see. Uh, and the, obviously the results that we want to see. So I'm going to right click on Motility Day and I'm going to hit add to scope. All right. So now it's going to say you've added an item to, to the target scope. Do you want burp proxy to, to stop sending out scope items, out of scope items to the history of the other burp tools? Yes. Again, we want to make sure that we are, we clear out all the junk that we don't need. Now you might have noticed, well, uh, that's, essentially happened, but nothing has uh, really changed. And it, as you can see, it's going to tell you here, logging of out of scope proxy traffic is disabled. Don't worry about that. Just leave it as it is. If you want to re-enable it, you can go ahead. But right now you don't need to do that. Okay. So we've looked at how to add uh, our target to the scope. Now, let's look at spidering. Spidering is essentially uh, the, the, the first and the most important step of web application penetration testing. All right. It is, it deals with, or it is in, in, it is in relation with, uh, footprinting. And this is why I bring the comparison from penetration testing to obviously web application penetration testing. It is to deal, it essentially deals with crawling through the website and then it records all the files, the links and the met the methods that uh, it can get. And that helps us build an idea of how the web application is structured, how it works. And then finally we can learn how we can break through it. What we need to do is uh, we need to spider our target well, we have added it to the scope, which is great. And now we need to spider it. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, we're going to use spidering and this will help us identify all the links and the parameters that we need. Again, as I said, it's like footprinting. So what you want to do is right click on your target, which in this case is Motility Day, and you want to hit spider this branch. All right. So I'm going to hit spider this branch. And now something interesting is going to start happening. As you can see, it's going to start getting all the links, all the resources that it can. And it's going to prompt you with here a submit form. Okay. Now, 
What you can do is just ignore the form. There'll be quite a few. Essentially, these are default login forms where it's asking you to enter credentials that you might want to enter. Let's say you, uh, you're performing white box penetration testing and you have the details. You can again log in like this and perform internal penetration tests. But we're going to assume that you, you do not know your penetration. You're essentially performing a, uh, your penetration test on the security. So I'm going to ignore all of these forms. Okay. And as you can see, there's another one right there and the spidering is probably continuing. Now, if you want to view the status of the spidering, you can go into spider. And as you can see, you have your status of the spidering. And, uh, w once it's done, you will see that the requests made will stop changing and the bytes transferred, uh, will also stop changing. So we can, uh, stop the spider. Now, you noticed something that we were faced with those uh, form login prompts. Now, you can choose to, to enter them as it, it prompts or, or as you are prompted. But the better way of doing this is to actually, you can actually do this uh, automatically. And you can do this by going into spider and you want to go into options and you want to go into your application login. All right. Now, if you look at the form submission, uh, it is uh, essentially what it's doing is it's going to use the default form submissions that you would find in a database. So, for example, you have mail, first name, last name, surname, uh, name, address. You you get the idea. So those are default values that one would uh, one would be expected to find. Now we're looking at the application login. As you can see, uh, its option is set to prompt for guidance. We want to change this to, to automatically submit these credentials. Now in here, you can enter default credentials, or if you have an idea of what the, the credentials you might expect to find. Now, this is where creativity and uh, sheer information gathering comes into play. So if you knew the default, uh, you know, usernames and passwords, you can enter them here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter a string that is, uh, well, I've used it before in uh, performing SQL injection and we'll talk about SQL injection because it is very advanced. If you know SQL injection or you have a, you have an idea or experience with the databases, you might understand what this string means. All right. So for my username, I'm going to change that to admin, uh, quotation mark and, uh, I'm going to say or one equal one. Uh, and uh, two dashes, all right, space and a dash. Now, you don't need to worry what this means for now. Please do not stress about this. I will explain it when the time is right, all right? So, uh, leave the password as it is and don't worry about that. Now, we, had, we don't need to change anything in, in terms of these tabs. We talked about these tabs in the theory section, and now we can go back into our control and target, and finally, we can spider the application again once more so that we can enter the uh, we can essentially process the strings that we that we just entered in, in terms of the username. So I'm going to right click and spider this branch. OK, so it's going to start spidering. And if you look at the spider, you can see that the, the spidering is complete and uh, you can essentially clear the queues if you want to clear clear them like so. And you can keep on running it depending on what you want to do. OK, so I'm just going to pause it. And now we have essentially spidered the web application. And you might be asking, well, Hmm, I've seen a few reference sites. That's not helping much. You know, we don't need twitter.com or, you know, sizzle.js. This might give us a basic idea of what types of uh, sites are linked to, to the web application. But in reality, you can see we have hackers.org. Not, not very important information at all. Now, what if we click on the Mutilide folder? Oh, look at that. That's really interesting. Now that is very, very important. What has happened here is it's given us the structure of the web application. This is vitally important. All right. Now, again, as I'm saying, uh, you can look at how the website or the web application is structured. So in documentation, you can see, you can go ahead and read the documentation. You can look at the images that the website has, the styles. So you can inspect the entire site and understand what exactly is going on here or get an idea of what the person who developed the website was thinking. And then finally, out of experience or as we'll be looking at, uh, out of knowledge, you can actually uh, understand how to exploit a system. And that's where we'll be talking about uh, discovering hidden files, hidden files like admin pages, login pages, you know, that really juicy stuff. And uh, we'll be talking about that in the next video. And that's because uh, Burp Suite Community Edition does not support or have uh, allow you to use that feature. So what I'm going to do in the next video, I'm going to be using Burp Suite Pro and I'll also show you an alternative program. I'm sure you, you, you've you heard of it uh, that also works on Windows. Of course, Burp Suite works on Windows, but I'm not really a Windows fan when it comes down to penetration testing. Uh, so that being said, um, we have essentially spidered the application. We have the structure of the web application. 
And now we need to look at something also very interesting as we have already talked about it. Uh, let, let me just complete, uh, let, let me just show you how to get rid of all of these reference links and to essentially show the items in the scope only. So what you can do is just click on filter right here. This little bar here uh, is the filter bar. So click on it and it's going to show you, bring up this small little window and you want to focus on the filter by request type and make sure you check show only in scope items. This will essentially filter all the results to show you only uh, links, uh, resources or files that are within the scope. So once that's done, just click back on the filter. And as you can see, it has got rid of all the junk that you do not need whatsoever. And now you can essentially look at the, uh, the requests and the responses and analyze them accurately, uh, defined to your scope. And this will essentially, uh, it will stop confusing you. I've seen many beginners make this mistake where they don't define their scope. They do not know what their target is and they're getting links that, that are, do not even relate to the website that they're, they're trying to perform the penetration test on. Now, since you know this knowledge, this will help you get a solid foundation. And uh, again, you can start logging out of scope, uh, out of scope proxy traffic when you want. Uh, again, that's very nice that they add that button right over there. All right. So now you only have uh, the files that you require or the files that you're currently performing the penetration test only. Now I know this, uh, this video was slightly, it, uh, there was not a lot of action, but again, it is very important that you get this in the next video. We'll be looking at uh, how to how to discover hidden files or files in general that you are not supposed to find okay and that can be done by right clicking and going into engagement tools as you can see it is defined to the professional version of web suite and we will be going into discover content where i'll be explaining to you how to find things uh like the login page or the configuration page some things that uh web developers you know actually just uh may try to hide them but if uh if actually found can really exploit the website or can lead to the exploitation of the website. We we're going to start looking at how to discover hidden files. Uh, but before that, I just want to take you through a few things. All right. So let's start off with what OASP is or OWASP. All right. So what does that mean? Well, essentially what it means or what it stands for is the Open Web Application Security Project. All right. And its goal, uh, well, essentially it is a nonprofit organization whose goal is focused on improving uh, the security of software. All right. So its job is to improve the security of software. Now, this uh, project, the OWASP uh, or the, the Open Web Application Security Project, created a tool called the Z attack proxy, or uh, as you know it, the ZAP. Uh, many people like calling it ZAP, and I'm sure most of you have heard of it, and you might have uh, been, uh, you might be leaning towards uh, Burp Suite a little bit more, but I can guarantee you that ZAP is one of my favorite tools, and I use it because firstly, it's free, and for, for, for the people, like for the students I teach, uh, I usually tell them to start with Zap because if you get Zap, you'll automatically get Burp Suite. And you only need Burp Suite when you're moving into an enterprise environment where, uh, you know, Burp Suite is the recommended tool and it is the tool that you must use to adhere to, to certain, uh, rules and ethics. That being said, Zap is a fantastic tool. It's absolutely free. As you can see, the OWSP Z attack pro uh, proxy, which is, uh, you know, abbreviated as Zap is one of the world's most popular free security tools and is actively maintained by hundreds of international volunteers. All right, so it, it helps you find security vulnerabilities in your web applications while you're developing and testing your applications. So again, if you're a web application developer, this is also a fantastic tool for you. And as I said, it's going to be a fantastic alternative to, um, to Burp Suite. All right, now that's not to say that Burp is bad. Uh, Burp is more of a enterprise uh, an uh, enterprise developed software in, as I've mentioned in the, fr in the first video of this series, uh, Burp is focused on professionals. Uh, now that's not to say that Zap isn't, but you'll get the idea. All right. So I'm going to be making a separate video on installing Zap and uh, I'm going to make a video on how to get accustomed to the interface because it is slightly different and the language or English used uh, for the interface is again very uh, well, I'll not say very different, but uh, it is quite different. So again, getting used to it was also something that is uh, quite helpful because we'll be needing some of the enterprise features and uh, uh, on, only a tool like Zap will be a great uh, alternative. However, if you do have Burp Suite Pro, uh, go ahead. It'll it'll just be the same thing as I mentioned in the previous video. It's really very easy to, to follow up where we left. Okay, uh, that being said, 
it runs on the same network proxy it runs on the local host so make sure you're running it on the uh, local host and uh, on port 8080 i'll be showing you how to change the port if you so feel you want to that's also another great thing about uh, a zap is uh, it allows you to change the proxies so I have Motile Day opened up here and it is again running on my Metasploitable 2 virtual machine and it's running on the IP address, my local IP address 192.168.1.104 as you can see Motile Day. All right, so that's working perfectly. Uh, so let me just uh, leave those other tabs open because again, there's no, re there's no real harm. Okay, so uh, again, you can configure the, the Motile Day security level if that's what you want, you know, to to make things harder but i'm just going to be showing you uh, the focus of this video which is how to find hidden files now you might be asking why do we need to find hidden files or uh, why do we need to discover these hidden files well hidden files firstly are the files like admin login pages you know uh, m maybe a robots.txt but that's not really uh, something that's hidden nowadays it could be a txt containing maybe usernames you know something really weird or uh, i you know pardon my english or pardon my language Language, something dumb that the web uh, developer has left behind or you know just not configured correctly and you'll see what I mean in a few seconds all right so again these are the files that are hidden and you will not find them after spidering your web application or website all right so let's get started with zap as you can see I have the logo right here on my it's added to my favorites let me just launch it give it a few seconds and it, it should start up there we are the zap uh, give it a few seconds again and make sure you update it usually the updates for the modules very very regularly So make sure you update them to the latest version uh, as they improve the speed and so on and so forth All right, so it's going to prompt you here. Do you want to persist the zap session? That means do you want to save uh, this zap session? I do want I do not want to persist at the session at this moment in time. So I'm going to hit start Again, don't worry if you're not familiar with the interface uh, I'll be going through it in another video because it deserves. Now you might be uh, a little bit overwhelmed, but do not worry. Do not start going to, you know, URLs to attack. That may seem really, really tempting. But again, you know, let's take it nice and easy. So let's talk about the proxy, how to change the proxies. So to do that, you can go into your cog right here, as you can see, or you can go into tools and go into options. All right. But uh, I like going into this little cog here. And once you press on the, uh, once you click on the cog, uh, let me just enlarge that, uh, you'll see that you have this huge menu. And again, as I said, Zap is a really advanced tool. And uh, in some cases, it can uh, totally re replace Burp Suite. Now, uh, looking at the proxies, you want to go for the local proxies right here. It's um, obviously starting with L. So local proxies and uh, make sure that the address is hosted on localhost. And you can change the port if you're using Burp Suite and stuff like if you're just uh, if you're using both the applications at the same time or you, you're running something on local host already. So you can change it to something like 8081, whatever you feel is comfortable for you. OK, so that's how to change your proxies. And if you're running behind a NAT, you can also uh, check this and uh, you should be good there if you don't uh, find that the proxy is working. So just hit OK. All right. Now, uh, you, you see that there's no, uh, we're not going to be looking at intercepting right now, but we'll be looking at that in a few, uh, in probably in the next videos, uh, the advanced videos with SAP. All right, so let me just reload the Motility Day page. And uh, as you can see, I'm running the proxy. So I'm just going to reload the page. And as you can see, we're not intercepting actively. So, uh, whoa, what's this? Well, we got some files here. Um, let, let me just reload the page one more time. And there we are. We are getting some results. So we get the IP. Uh, 192.168.1.104 that's the server and if we uh, just click on this drop down here we get the get request so you can analyze the get request if that's what you want so you can right click and then analyze all right now we'll not be looking at that right now because i want to focus on uh, finding the or discovering the hidden files uh, so what we'll do is we want to click on the motility folder now one of the great things i like about zap is it already gives you the file structure or the website structure immediately here all right, so you can see you have your images folder, uh, which has its uh, the images there. You have JavaScript styles and uh, your, all the resources uh, in regards to the website that it could find naturally. All right. So um, if we uh, if we just look at the bottom here, you can see that it uh, it's showing you a timestamp with the method, the URL, 
and it gives you the the code which means the page is um, in this case uh, the 200 code means the page was found you have the reason you have the rtt uh, the size the alert as you can see it's telling us we have a high alert here now don't worry about that again these are things that uh, you know will be uh, will really be tempting but again let's take it slow all right so the first thing you want to do or you need to do is to right click here and you want to go to attack and hit spider all right so we want to spider the website or the web application and start scan do not touch anything here just make sure it's uh, using the appropriate server address and just hit scan all right now it's going to spider the entire web application and it's going to give you a little progress bar here you can pause it or stop it which is also great to see at the bottom you should have also noticed that you have your tabs here that work really really well and as you can see the um the website now is completely spidered and if we just uh, check all the files that we can find now you can see that we have uh, some more JavaScript files and essentially what's happened here is the entire site has been um, has been spidered. Okay, now we already did this with Burp and the you know you, you're probably really bored of this right now. So what we're gonna do now is we need to uh, we, we need to start discovering the hidden content. All right, so let me just close all of this up. There we are, fantastic. Now uh, let me just open that up and let's go to Matilda Day. Oops, my bad. Sorry about that, guys. And we want to right click on Matilda Day and you want to go to attack and you want to go to forced browse directory and children. That's very important. Forced browse directory will not display everything. We'll also be looking at fuzzing, but that's for later. All right. So you want to make sure you hit forced browse directory. Just click on that and it's going to open the, up this tab here. So you can see we had the spider tab open, which you can close if you're, if you're not using it, which is also great. I really like the management of Zap. You then have output for, for your outputs, alerts, as you can see, you have some alerts here that uh, will alert you on some potential vulnerabilities. So for example, application error disclose, uh, you have some cookies, no HTTP flag. So again, awesome stuff there. Uh, we have the get requests, uh, all that good stuff, which is uh, again, focused on a different type of attack. And as you can see, by default, we've got the robots.txt here, which you can analyze if you want to. Uh, by right clicking and going ahead and doing that so you can copy the url to the browser so again uh, copy the url to clipboard all right and if we just try and explore this let me just paste and go here as you can see well, for some reason we are not actually getting robots to txt uh, let me use the motility uh, motility or actually you know what Let, let's not do that right now because i really want to stay on topic here so i'm just gonna go back into zap again i, I always love going off top fourth topic for some reason okay so make sure you click on motility and you want to right click on it and uh, now uh, oh sorry we already did the forced browse so right click go to attack and forced browse uh, directory and children all right, now it's going to open up this tab here and it's going to uh, it's going to make you choose the site. As you can see, you have your site IP here. Now you need to select the default directory list. So it's going to use this list here, this default list that uh, comes already with Zap. And now it's going to try and use it uh, in, in a sort of a brute force way to try and detect the hidden files and folders. And once it gets the result, it's going to enumerate them. OK, so now you want to right click again on it after you've selected the list and hit attack and you want to go to false browse directory and children and once you hit that it's going to start the process now again this is going to take a long uh, well not a long time depending on this the the size of the website if the site is huge then again it's going to take a while and as you can see immediately we're getting some some hidden files uh so, so let's uh let's wait for this code to complete and i know motility has some very very interesting files here that uh, i'm sure we'll be happy to get all right, so just uh, let, let it go through this. Uh, as you can see, you can check the progress as you're going here. And again, the, the if you look at the status code, you can see 200 means the pages were found. So you can just go ahead and look for things that are irregular. And I'm sure we can find something here that we haven't found before. Or you can look at the uh, at the file uh, for um, the uh, the website directory here. So. Um, Motility Day, uh, let's see if we can find something that is really, really interesting here. So we have the includes, we have the get index.php, the get request, sorry, for the index. Oh, we have something interesting here. We have a notes folder. Aha, now we're talking. Now this is where stuff gets really exciting. All right, so we have, uh, whoops, where did it go? Hmm, there we are. So in, in notes, we have some very interesting files in notes. So uh, we have a get passwords. Now what happens? What's this about? 
All right. So what if what what if we just uh, open this URL in, in the browser? All right. So let me just try and open that in Firefox. I just want to see what it's going to be all about. So hopefully it's opened up in my browser. If it's not, I'll have to copy the URL. Uh, probably because I haven't set any uh, any default. All right, so copy URLs to clipboard. And uh, let me just paste that in there. Paste and go. There we are, Matilde and passwords. All right, so you can see that this folder or this file was hidden. And uh, uh, we have an interesting TXT file here, which again is quite scary to be, oh, it did open Firefox. Well, don't doesn't look like we need that instance. So uh, getting back to the topic here. Oh, for some reason, process unexpectedly closed with, uh, all right, so that looks like we have a Java error there. Um, so let me just go back in, over here. So again, we found an accounts.txt file. What could that be carrying? Let's click on that. Oh boy. So again, we have uh, accounts here and, uh, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure you would know what this means. This is just bad practice from the website developer where he wrote notes and essentially these are the accounts. Now let's see what else we can find. Um, let's see accounts, nothing interesting in accounts because we now have the accounts, So that makes our brute force much easier. You then have, uh, let's see if we can find any passwords if they were ever saved here. I'm pretty sure they are not, but uh, we can let's look for some interesting files here that can be really interesting. You can look at the sitemap if you want to. So let's also copy that. Let's see if it gives us access to the sitemap. Also very, very important stuff there. Oh yeah, so the sitemap, uh, for some reason, we were not able to process it. Um, all right, let, let's look for some other files here. Uh, let me just open that Mutilide again. Um, so we have the get images. Let's see if we run the get images. Let's see what images we can get. Uh, again, I'm going pretty amateurish on this. I'm just clicking on everything, but I'm just trying to show you the amount of files that you can find. As you can see, immediately you can find the refresh button, uh, you know, all, all the icons related to the website. Uh, you have the iHack banner. <laughs> oh yeah, hackers for charity, man. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> YouTube. Oh my God, what an old logo that is. You have the OWSP logo. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Uh, and yeah, so you get the idea. So this is how you actually go through a website and find files that could contain, you know, stuff that is uh, quite interesting, to be honest. So let's see what else we can find. I'm just going to go through one more resource here that we've uh, found. Oh, we have the get register. Oh, now that's what I'm talking about. Copy URL to clipboard. It's actually, this is actually quite fun. This is why bug bounty hunting is... Oh yeah, now this is what I'm told. We can actually register our, our uh, uh, we can actually register ourselves on the website. Now again, looking at the website from here, uh, it doesn't look like we can. Uh, can we even register on this website? I'm not sure we can. Uh, for some reason, it's not actually letting me scroll to the top. But uh, hey, I don't really know what's going on there. So let's see if we. Yeah, we can definitely log in and register. Sorry about that. Uh, we can register there. So yes, it is the register. It does exist. So that wasn't actually hidden, but it was hidden. Uh, it was hidden to the, uh, uh, when, when we spidered the website. So that means indeed it was hidden for obvious reasons because the brute force, for example, if you find the login, which is again here. Uh, and again, if this is hidden, you can imagine the, the damage that you can do. So again, you can log in from there. Uh, set up database. Ooh, ooh, now that's interesting. For some reason, it's not letting me copy. Uh, all right, so it looks like we got set up database here. So yeah, we can, okay, I do not want to manually uh, edit the request. No, I do not want to manually edit the request. Uh, for some reason, my keyboard is being pressed here. Wow, that's weird, man. Copy your rows to clipboard. All right, sorry about that. My space bar was being mashed on by uh, my tablet in front of me. Right, so let me just, there we are. Um, so no PHP, MySQL errors were resetting. So I essentially reset the database and you can see the damage that this can do. So again, that is some good stuff that you can have fun with, uh, when, especially with Mutilida. You can increase the security and find what other files you can you can find, uh, you know, with Zap. Again, Zap is a fantastic alternative that you can use. Uh, if you know, if you are not ready to invest in Burp Suite, that's totally fine. I used 
uh, Zap for I think about three years, uh, especially since 2014. I think I used it until about uh, I think 2016 or 17. I'm not too sure, and it worked great for me. I really enjoyed it, and I'm just getting back to I'm just uh, remembering uh, how all the tools used to work. It was actually quite a user intuitive uh, interface because I just remember right clicking means you can copy the URL, you can inspect it, you can change the request, you can attack uh, all that good stuff, and you know it's sorted out really really well. All right, and you can look at the requests here. You can change them to whatever you want and then send them. You can intercept them. Uh, it essentially does whatever Burp Suite does. We're going to be looking at uh, web application firewalls or WAFs as they're called. Now, this may be a new term for you and do not worry. This is uh, now when we move into a more professional level. And again, this is what I'm be I've been talking about. Uh, is most people out there or most documented uh, documentation out there won't cover the most important industry standards you know now when i'm talking about web application firewalls what i mean is is these are the protection uh, or these are the mitigation um, procedures put in place to protect a web application from uh, attacks obviously now as a penetration tester or if you're looking at it from a white hat or a black hat perspective from white hat perspective it's always important to have a web application firewall and i'll probably make another video showing you how to set it up it's really easy and it's free and it'll uh, probably remove about 20 percent of attacks okay so that's if you're a white hat now if you're a black hat and you're targeting or you're performing a penetration test legally on a website or web application uh, usually what the employer will tell you is they'll give you a scope of the project and uh, again they might give you the source code etc etc you get the idea you have your white box testing black box and gray box uh, but coming back to the firewall most of them wouldn't know that there is a firewall and that's because the person who set the website up for them in terms of hosting or the web application for them uh, will in most cases on a professional level have a web application firewall. Now you might be a bit confused and you might be saying well why is this important when performing a penetration test? Well this is important because firstly it's something that most pen testers overlook and if you know this you've got an ace up your sleeve. All right so essentially what's happening is if it's being used uh, if a web application firewall is being used, uh, you, you obviously first need to detect it and I'm going to show you how to detect it in this video using a special tool that I don't think you've ever heard of. Uh, but it's also industry standard. So this is a real, real secret. I don't know, for some reason, it's not just, uh, it's something that just hasn't caught up yet. Uh, but hopefully after this video, you'll know about it. All right. So essentially the purpose of a web application firewall is, uh, it, uh, it, protects the web application uh you know from a firewall point of view in the sense that it blocks attacks uh as one would expect them to come now what does this mean for you well this means that uh, you will need to in uh, you will need to manipulate um any type of data that is going to be encoded all right so what this means is if you're if you're performing a penetration test that involves you manipulating data and sending it back to the web application, then you need to encode it in a specific way to bypass the firewall. Otherwise, it will be blocked by the firewall. And I'm sure most of you have re actually done this before. If you're just amateur penetration testers and you've just begun, you'll find that for some reason your requests aren't being processed. And that's because uh, there is a firewall set up to prevent these uh, malicious requests from being processed. Okay, so again, uh, web application firewall is really, really important. Now, looking at the tool we'll be using, the tool uh, has actually a very, very funny name. You, for some of you might find it hilarious. It is called Wafwoof. Now, for those of you who have heard of it, uh, you pretty much already know how to detect a, a web application firewall, but it's really very, very simple. All right, so just open up your terminal. And uh, what you want to do is you want to type in waf woof. All right. So this is how it is going to be uh, spelt. So it's waf uh, woof with a two uh, with two zeros. And uh, the syntax is pretty simple. If I just hit enter, as you can see, waf woof, a web application firewall detection tool. All right. So credits go to the author. It's actually it's a tool that's been there since the I think almost the last version of Backtrack and uh, the first version of Kali. So again, quite a, an old tool. I, when I say old, I mean, uh, you know, I mean that with respect, uh, given the fact that it's really, really useful. And I've used it a lot because it saves you a lot of time. And what I'm talking about is so. Um, uh, let, let's say we want to scan a website. Okay. Uh, in this case, I have my WordPress server running here. 
And as you can see, it, it's the site is being hosted on 192.168.1.101. All right, so I have that uh, IP opened up in my browser. And as you can see, it's a WordPress site. And this site is vulnerable. And this is what we're going to be performing uh, later on the penetration tests on. But for now, we want to find out whether it has a firewall. Now, by default, I know it doesn't have a firewall, but let's see what Wafwoof would tell us. All right, so the syntax is very simple. As you can see, you just type in Wafwoof and you enter your URL or your URL so you can enter as many as you like. Okay, so it'll give you an example there of how to go about it. Make sure you enter your HTTP or HTTPS protocol. And uh, we just, uh, let's try that out. So Wafwoof and we specify our protocol, HTTP in this case and the IP address 192.168.1.101. All right, now in this case, I'm pretty sure that uh, it won't detect any uh, web application firewall. So let me just hit enter. And as you can see, no web application firewall detected by the generic detection. All right, now this is very, very advanced and this tool is an industry standard. And if it does tell you that there is no uh, web application firewall, then by all means, I can guarantee that it, it does not have a firewall. Now let's look at one of my sites that I currently own. Uh, it's a site that uh, I use. Um, uh, it's actually my web development uh, company uh, that obviously we use uh, for web development. Now I've protected this site with a web application firewall provided by Cloudflare. Now for those of you who are web developers and when you're performing your hosting, you know that using Cloudflare is awesome because it allows you to optimize your site for speed. It allows you to purge assets and make your site faster, protect it, uh, and uh, again, protect it from uh, DDoS uh, attacks, etc., etc. All the good stuff. So let's see if it will actually detect this. So I'm going to type in Wafwoof. I know that name is really, really funny. The protocol uh, is HTTPS, uh, HTTPS like so. And I'm going to specify uh, the site, which is elgonstudios.com. All right, elgonstudios.com. And if I hit enter, as you can see, it's going to start checking the site. Give it a few seconds. It shouldn't take uh, any much, uh, you know, a lot of time. And as you can see, the site elgonstudios.com is behind Cloudflare. All right. Now, what this means is that most of the um, most of the attacks that involve manipulation of data uh, will be in some way blocked, and uh, you know you won't get your response back the way you wanted it, and the render wouldn't be the same. All right. Now, again, as you can see, it's detected that it is behind a web application firewall. Now, the next step is how to encode these, um, how to encode encode your your requests that you're going to be sending to the web application and that's what we'll be looking at as we increase the security level uh using the uh, the damn vulnerable web application all right so i thought this is something that i really uh, need to share with you again it's going to really help you and i promise you this is something that you know uh, if you go for a job interview or you're performing a penetration test for a company, this is something that uh, most of the network or systems administrators are very keen on. They want to know whether you really know your stuff and whether you're really up to date with how to detect, first of all, because information gathering is really important. And as you can see, this tool is fantastic. And once you know there's a firewall, you then have a better idea of how to target and you won't be wasting time. Again, that's something that most of the amateurs or beginners do. They waste a lot of time trying different commands that they've seen but they find they they, under, they see that it doesn't work and they're like how is this possible am i doing something wrong the truth is uh the web application is probably well protected so again uh you know do not use this for any malicious purposes uh, again this is simply an information gathering tool I'm going to be showing you how to use Derbuster to discover uh, directories and files on a website or a web application. You might be asking yourself, what is Derbuster? Or if you haven't heard of Derbuster, let me explain it to you. All right. So Derbuster is essentially a, a tool that uh, was developed by OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, and essentially uses a brute forcing to find commonly used directories and file names on servers. All right, so this tool is extremely useful for those of you who are doing CTFs or for those of you who are bug bounty hunters because essentially it allows you to understand the structure of a web uh, web application or a website in terms of the files and directories and how they are structured. All right, so why is this important? Well, this is important because this will help us understand how we can attack a site or what type of attack vectors we can we can we can find you know so for example if i had a web application and i'm going to demonstrate that right now and i scanned it with derbust and we found some hidden directories and hidden files we can use these as attack vectors all right so 
as I said, it also allows you to find hidden directories or, uh, or files that are hidden from the public. So this can also lead you to, uh, to finding uh, additional resources that could have been hidden away by the devs, that, like for example, uh, admin pages, etc., etc. All right, so how does it work? Well, really simply, uh, once you start up Durbuster, and uh, again, as I mentioned, it uses brute forcing, so I'll explain where word lists come into play. Um, so you open it up and you select the URL of the web application or the website, and you specify the port. The port is, is, de is definitely going to be HTTP, so uh, either a port 80 or port 443, and then you select the word list. Now, in this case, Kali Linux already has a Dur uh, Durbuster word list uh, that, uh, that are designed. It has three of them that are designed for different types of scenarios, and I'll explain them as we move along. All right, and essentially how it works is once you start the brute force attack, it will send HTTP GET requests and it will wait for the response from the server or the web, the web application. If it gets a 200 uh, response, that means that yes, that directory exists. All right, if it, get, if it gets a bad response, meaning like 400 or 403, meaning no access, then it'll, it'll, it'll know that that directory or file doesn't exist. So it's essentially testing directories on the server against this, uh, this word list. So it will check, for example, is there a temp folder? If it sends a temp request to the server, it gets a response, a positive response, then it knows it's there and then it will enumerate them. All right, so let's start off uh, re uh, really, really simply here. So I'm on Kali Linux, I have the OS uh, broken web application right here, and I'm going to be demonstrating uh, two scenarios. So you can see I'm running that here, and that has a lot of vulnerable web applications, but the whole idea is to demonstrate how directories can be found. All right, and why this is extremely important, especially for a web application penetration tester. All right, so uh, I'm gonna open up Firefox, and as you can see, I have the open web application uh, project right here, the OASP B WAP as they call it, and it has plenty of uh, of ways of me testing this. But what if I was to just test the entire server? All right, so this is a web server. What if I was to test the entire web server? Well, I'm guessing that there are going to be a lot of files and directories. So what we can do is uh, we can start off with a perfect example of how this will work is let's say you're targeting a WordPress site. So I'm going to open up the broken WordPress. Now, of course, this is a very old one and we're not really exploiting anything. But uh, by using this example, it will let us understand how we can enumerate the different directories and folders, uh, uh, you know, on, on this WordPress installation. Or if you are target targeting a WordPress site, this is the way you do it. So I'm going to copy the URL with the... Uh, with the directory right here, so it, we know it's in the WordPress folder because that is the root directory of the of the web server, and we're selecting the WordPress installation. But for the website, you'll select the URL, all right? Uh, and as for the port, we know that this is the default HTTP port, which means it's port 80. All right, so I have Durbuster right here. If you can't find it, just uh, you can use the start menu and type in Durbuster. It's going to be like so. Just just click on it and give it a few seconds to start up. So again, it was designed by the OASP team, so it works really, really well. And uh, again, this is something that I'm sure if you if you are a web application penetration tester or you do do uh, the CTF challenges, then you'll you'll know that you use this tool a lot. All right, so we in here we have the target URL, and that's where we we would paste it. All right, so um, we can paste it right here. So Control V, and that is the URL. Now in the work method, if you want to, if you want the scan to be faster, you can use the get requests. But what we can do is auto switch them uh, from the head and get, and that will give us a more robust or a more accurate uh, response rate. All right. So in terms of the number of threads, this is how fast you want uh, you want the scan or the brute force to be. So the faster, the better, depending on your hardware. And uh, of course, you don't want to overload the server. So I'm just going to go hit click on go faster. That's probably works the best for me. But if you want it to run faster, uh, then that means it's going to it's going to have multiple requests and threads being sent from your computer. All right. So I like keeping it at just 200 threads, which is go faster. And because I'm testing my own web server, I can, you know, I can pretty much increase it to whatever I want. Uh, so uh, usually if you're talking about a bigger server or a bigger web application, then it doesn't really matter how many requests or how many threads you use. Uh, it will not really affect the performance of the web server. But if I was to run it at maybe a maximum speed, you would see that the web server would be lagging out, um, you know, out of the amount of requests that are being sent 
because you know you have to understand it from a fundamental point of view we are requesting the different web pages and the server has to process them so if the if the, if the server is not running on on you know good resources like it's running on one gigabyte of ram it's very easy to make it lag out and to actually cause some sort of a denial of service just because of the amount of requests but in this case we are performing it you know with a with an ethical perspective so now you want to select a list based brute force or you can use a pr pure brute force but i don't recommend that that doesn't really work and you now need to select your word list your dubbuster word list now by default on kali linux and on parrot os these are found in the user share folder on the under word list and you can find the dubbuster uh, word list right there so i'm going to show you that right now so i'm going to browse i'm going to go to my root and i'm going to go into user and i'm going to go into share and let's go into word lists here let's see if i can find it it's obviously with a w uh where it where is it uh let's see let's see let's see where is word lists um sorry if i can't see this yeah there we are sorry about that word lists and you now want to go into derb buster all right so there is going to be a folder called derb buster and now you m might be a little bit confused well really you don't need to need need to be confused that's why i'm here so uh as a beginner you might be wondering like which one is better now as an advanced penetration test i know which one is the best in most cases it's going to be the medium the directory list 2.3 medium.txt now if you're scanning a very small web application that that's not that really complex like a simple html site uh you know html css whatever you want to call it um then i would recommend the small one but if you're scanning a a big site like a wordpress installation or a joomla installation then you you should use the medium one this will work 99% of the time unless your your um your requests are being blocked by either a web application firewall or by the uh the host so i'm just going to select list all right and now in terms of these other options you can see it's uh, it's going to essentially brute brute force the directories the files it's going to be recursive which is great and the directory you must specify the directory if it is if you are trying to perform a scan that is directory sensitive all right and uh standard uh start point just leave it like that and you now want to hit start all right so once you start it's going to start brute forcing the web server against uh it's going to start sending the requests and if it gets the responses the positive responses it's going to uh, it's going to understand that yes that directory does exist now you can see we have a response that is being sent here and it's going to tell us, tell you that it is unable to determine a consistent fail response which means uh some directories and files are being uh you're getting a negative or uh you you're getting a, a no access response meaning that that directory doesn't exist so what you can do is just hit cancel to these ones and hit yes and it's going to continue scanning the other ones now of course down here you can see since it's performing a brute force you can look at the current speed which uh, varies dependent on the amount of directories the average speed um and it'll tell you the total amount of requests done out of the amount that could be done depending on on, on the word list that you have selected and finally you have the time to finish now of course this will vary depending on a lot of uh factors but mostly it depends on the the uh, the speed of the scan that you've selected and the and the word list so you have your scan information here it's going to tell you what uh, folders and files it's testing and uh, in here you can see the results in terms of directories and files that it was able to find and in the results it, it this is going to give you the directory structure as to how files and folders are being structured on the web application now by default right now you can see the amount uh, the files and folders that it has found are for example the wordpress register.php so if we open that if you right click on it you can open it in the url or you can view the response that it gave and you can copy it you understand you get the basic functionality here and then you can open it in your browser so again you see with that we are finding files that we otherwise wouldn't have known existed now of course for a default wordpress installation you would have guessed that this does exist but remember most people uh for, for for most other installations on configure configurations this can be a great way of finding files and folders that you didn't know existed and uh, again discovering them is very very important and this can give you different attack vectors for so for example if i went to the admin.php and it forced me to log in that might be a good place to start brute forcing if i had credentials if not you can choose select another attack vector so let me just move back here you can see we have the register page here which we just clicked on let's uh, look at the wordpress 
login.php so i'm going to open that up in the browser now you can see the server is not responding and that's another point that i wanted to point out if you want to be as uh you know right now we are being as promiscuous as possible because we it's not really a, pro, a web application that is delivering service to other people but because it's hosted on my local air network so in this case you can see we are performing a type of denial of service and that's because the server i've allocated very very minimal resources to this uh, virtual machine so that's why it's kind of lagging out all right so that's something to take into consideration now if i was to to pause the attack like so if i was to just pause it remember you can pause it and you can stop it and uh, let me just go back here and let's see if we can reload these pages. They, they should be able to to be reloaded quicker now. Let me, let me just load that up and uh, we can close this one. Let's see if the WordPress register page does open up. Uh, if this uh, virtual, yeah, there we are. So you can see, uh, even though this is a very old WordPress installation, that we were causing it to lag out. So uh, always keep that in mind that the amount of threads that you select can affect the performance uh, of the website of, or of the web application and you don't want to cause any uh, any impact to customers if you're performing the test on a real world working web application or website all right just something you might want to take into consideration so we're going to resume it and of course i'm not going to expect to find anything weird here although this wordpress installation is designed to be vulnerable so you can also change the number of threads running right here so if I wanted it to run, uh, you know, maybe on 10 threads, which is quite slow, that means you'll get uh, the enumeration process will take longer. Uh, so it's all about balancing your resources and understanding what you're trying to look for. Now, of course, this can be a very, very useful tool when uh, doing bug bounties or, uh, or CTF for that matter, especially hack the box. we are going to be looking at something that is extremely important and something that should be understood completely and that is cross-site scripting all right now before we get started i'm just going to uh, explain what we're going to be looking at explain what we're going to be looking at in this video we're going to start off with explaining what uh, cross-site scripting is i'm going to be showing you the environment that we'll be using for testing any of these uh any of these attacks just because they allow us to illustrate or they allow me to explain how everything works because that's the most important thing for me is that you understand what you're you're listening to and you have a good representation of what's going on all right so i'll be explaining stored um uh, i'll be explaining reflected stored and dom uh, cross-site scripting all right so let's get started with me explaining what environment I'm currently running. So you can see that I'm running Kali Linux right now, but uh, I am going to be using the OASP Broken Web Applications Project. Uh, so I'll have this in the description section. It is essentially a virtual machine that you can easily just run on VirtualBox or VMware. I'm currently running it here. Uh, as you can see, I just got the uh, local IP. It's uh, 192.168.1.111. All right, so I have that running and I'm running this on Kali Linux and I already have opened up um, the URL in my browser. So you can see uh, from here, I've opened up BWAP and I've opened up WebGoat because that's what I'm going to be using to explain each of these uh, cross-site scripting attacks. So if I was to do that, uh, if I was to just open up 192.168.1.111, yours could be different. It, it should be different depending on your IP configuration and subnet. Then it'll take you to the OS uh, BWA or the OS Broken Web Applications Project. The latest version as of recording this video is version 1.2. So we will be using WebGoat and BWAP um, or the Broken Web Application Project uh, for uh, for this demonstration. So the default credentials for WebGoat are going to be guest for the username and guest for the password. And for BWAP, it, it should give you the prompt uh, right over there. Uh, I, th I think it's going to be a bug app or something like that. But irregardless, it will tell you what it is. All right, so make sure you open that up and you have that all set up. So I've logged into BWEP and I have a WebGoat started up right here. All right, so let me close that up and we are ready to go. Now, before we even move on into performing these attacks, it's very important to understand what's going on here with uh, with cross-site scripting, what it is, how it works, and what are you exactly taking advantage of. All right, now, uh, this is where a lot of people make mistakes and if you want to be a successful web application penetration tester you need to understand you know from a fundamental level what's going on here 
All right, so let's get started. What is cr cross-site scripting? Well, uh, simply put, it is the process of injecting a script into a into the parameter in a URL to attack a user of the site or to potentially attack the server side of uh, of the website or the web application. All right, so it essentially is the inject uh, the injection of a script into the parameter of a URL. All right, that's essentially what it is. Now, of course, this may be quite confusing, but don't worry, I'll explain what's going on here. So let's start off with, uh, with first of all, explaining the, the three types of uh, cross-site scripting. All right, the first one is reflected, and then we have stored and DOM. So with reflected, what's happening here is uh, the, the data is inputted and then you know reflected directly back um, back on the screen. So I'll explain this in a second. All right, so uh, if we are to look at this from a fundamental perspective, I'll show you how to access this, uh, you know, how to navigate the BWAP. Uh, just give me a second, let me explain what's going on. So essentially what's happening with reflected cross-site scripting is that the input is going to be stored in the parameter of the URL. All right, and I'll explain how this differs with each type of attack because many of you will point out and say, well, it's not only to, to do with parameters and don't worry, I'll explain all of this. All right, so we can essentially manipulate the uh, the parameter of the URL uh, so that we can essentially run a script. Now, what type of script? We can run a malicious script that is based in JavaScript, and I'll explain that right now. So you can see with our portal, you don't want to touch anything here. You can set the security level, but for now, I recommend setting it to low. Not that that's going to hurt anyone's ego, uh, because remember, you have to be humble to, to begin, and you need to understand what's going on first. So we will open up the choose the bug section here and we want to go down into cross site scripting and we want to go into reflected, which uh, essentially deals with the get uh, the get request. So we're going to start off with that and this will really make you understand what's going on here. So if I click on that um, and I just hit hack. All right. So now it's going to give us a prompt here and you might be asking, well, what's what do you mean? What exactly is going on? If I was to not enter any details into the, um, you know, into these fields right here. So for example, you can see I just had a suggestion there. That's because I was testing it out. But if I was to hit go, you can see that in the URL, we do have the input here. So you can see the values can be edited directly into the form. So you can see first name has the, uh, the no value. And then we have the last name, which again has no value. And you can see that it is submitting a form. So what we can do is run some JavaScript code in here. And the most common way of, uh, of explaining what's going on here, of course, not running a very malicious code right now, ex essentially explaining and demonstrating that it does work is I can run a piece of code here. Now, of course, when you put this into a practical perspective, many sites are going to filter the content that you can enter in, in these fields or these forms uh, and uh, will essentially, uh, we will not allow you to run JavaScript code, you know, obviously to protect, uh, to pr protect the site from these type of attacks. Uh, but what you can do is en encapsulate it or encode it in a different type of language. Or as I said, I'll, I'll show you all everything uh, or how all of this works. So this right right now, being the current security level as low, we uh it'll not uh, it'll not essentially encode it'll not verify or validate what we're entering in here, what input is being uh, given. So if we were to type in a script here, so you can say script and you can see the recommendation there script, that's mine. So if I was to type in alert and uh, this is JavaScript, so I'm pretty I'm pretty sure you can you know what's going on. So we can say hello world. Um, this is an example of a reflected um, XSS or cross site scripting. And we can close that up right now. And then we need to close the script. So we can do that in the next field or the next parameter. Most people like doing it from the start, but this is just to show you how robust this can be. So I type in, I close the script there and I hit go. And as you can see, it gives us the alert, which is what we, uh, and we which is what we used as our form of sh of me showing you that it does work and it will be processed. Uh, the input will be processed and will be sent back to you, you being the client. And we can just hit OK. And that was an example of reflected access uh, cross-site scripting using the get method. Now, of course, we can I can replicate this many, many times using the other types of cross-site scripting, for example, with the post, etc., etc. We'll be looking at all of that. But for now, we need to understand what's going on here. 
Now, next, we need to look at stored uh, cross-site scripting. This is probably my favorite because of the potential that it does have. All right, so let's go into the choose your bug menu here. And uh, we want to go into cross-site scripting and we want to go, um, we want to go for the blog. Cross-site scripting, stored uh, cross-site scripting, and we're going to select blog. And I'll explain why in a second. All right, so first, let me explain what stored cross-site scripting is. So essentially with this uh, with the cross site uh, scripting attacks more specifically the stored attacks uh, essentially what's happening is you're attacking the input uh, and you're essentially attacking the input that is to be stored or you're attacking the data or essentially uh, i'll explain this really simply so you're attacking the input that is to be stored on a database so what you're doing is you're essentially injecting malicious code that will be saved into a database or that is going to be saved by the server or the web application server. And then you can definitely, uh, you since it's being stored, you can access it later on or other users can access it. And for example, if it's running malicious code, it can trigger different things like opening the webcam of a user, stealing different type of information. I'm not going to go into what you can do with it, but you can really do a lot of stuff a lot of malicious stuff with code. All right, so let me explain what's going on here. So with the stored cross-site scripting, you can essentially inject uh, malicious code into the database. Again, that then uh, that when accessed runs this malicious code. All right, so if I, you can see, this is an example of a blog. Let me explain what I mean. The best places to implement stored cross-site scripting is in places like comments, uh you know forums and again as you can see right here blog in the form of comments that you know or pages that can be accessed later or data that is being stored in directly into the database any database for that matter as long as it's being stored okay so we can type in here something like hello and we can submit that to the database and you can see it's getting stored and you have the different tables you have the uh the number the owner the date and the entry so now we can also run a script in here all right, so what if we were to enter a JavaScript, uh, and again, this data, given our security level, is any of the data that we're entering is not being validated, so you can essentially enter it raw. Uh, now, in re reality, if you go and try and enter a script in, the data uh, will not be accepted because, again, they're protecting their site against that. That's one way of mitigation, very basic. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. All right, so enough of me rambling on. So if we were to enter the same script we entered, uh, so we, we have to say script and we then say alert, for example, we can, you can use any type of JavaScript code you want here and you can experiment, you know, you, these web applications are there for you to experiment and test your skills out. So, uh, if I was to say, hello world, this is stored, uh, whoops, stored, uh, cross site scripting. And we just close that up there. And of course we have to close the script because we know that that will not execute if we do not code it correctly. Okay, so now we can we can add that. Uh, and uh, if I was to just hit submit right now, you can see that it's going to store and be, that being the latest blog post, you can see it's going to tell you it's going to execute the script and it's going to say hello world, this is stored uh, cross site scripting. So in an example of a blog, if you are to post this uh, on a page or a or, uh, you know, to make a blog post and inject this script in anyone who opens that page will essentially run that malicious code and whatever that code does can then furthermore you know uh, cause damage to the user or to the server depending on what you want it to do so it's all dependent on what the attacker is to do remember what i told you in the first video of this series it's all about your mindset and your 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 willingness to break things and to find out what does and doesn't work okay so that was an example of stored cross-site scripting uh, and as I've mentioned, the most important thing to understand is this, in this scenario, the data is not being validated. If it is being validated, and I'll show you that in a second, uh, or probably in the next set of videos, we'll increase the security level and I'll show you how to get, you know, past this. You can see how things change as you move along in terms of security levels. So uh, I was going to use the uh, BWAP. Uh, this is my first time using it. Uh, so I had to get a bit of an introduction through the documentation and I realized they don't have DOM uh, cross-site scripting. So uh, I that's why I had to use WebGoat. They are the only ones I know who actually allow us to run it. So I've, I've zoomed in right now. By the way, the credentials are guessed for the username and guessed for the password. So uh, 
essentially I went through cross-site scripting and again, they didn't have the, the DOM in here. All they were focusing on is stored and again, uh, reflected. So I found it to be in the Ajax or Ajax, whatever you want to call it. And we have the, uh, the DOM based, uh, uh, cross-site scripting. Let me explain why it's saying, uh, this is based in Ajax security. This is uh, because DOM cross-site scripting focuses on the client side. So any data or input that is entered, whether it be a malicious code, etc., etc., is going to be processed by the client, not the server. So any of the attacks will be based, of course, on the client. Now, let me explain what I mean. Uh, if I am to run, remember JavaScript server side, client side, I, AX, for example. So if I am to run, uh, for example, a, a JavaScript code in this entry here so script and again i type in alert just being the example and i say hello let's keep that simple and i close the script here you can see that we will probably not be left with anything will not get any result that's because it's being processed by the client not by the server so no uh no result or no data will be reflected back to us if it was you know if it was reflected cross-site scripting it uh, the server processes it and then is reflected back to the client so if i was to submit here you can see that nothing happens here and that it is going to be taken as code. Now, what if we were to enter or use a language uh, that uh, that a client can understand? So let's say we were to to say, uh, let's see, um, HTML. What if we were to use HTML? So I, I can say in here, IMG, for example, that's a very, this is the way we learned it. So IMG SRC and we don't have an image source so we can leave that like that and then we can use the on error in case we get an error of image which we will get because the image has no source on error uh, we can say that is going to be uh that is going to be equal to uh, alert um and then the alert we can then put in here we can say hello oops hello world and we can close that up and once we have closed it you can see that we can uh uh, we can close that there and there you are so it is going to be processed by the client and you get the the dialog box or the alert with the message hello world so you can see that uh, with dom based cross-site scripting uh, it is all being processed all the input whether it be malicious or not is being processed by the client and ajax is one of the la these languages that can be used so you can also incorporate ajax if you wanted to or test it out remember it's all about experimentation and understanding i hope that you you've got an understanding of what cross-site scripting is how it can be used to manipulate data whether it be on the client side on the database and how you can easily just uh, transfer data with you know bad security in place of course this is these attacks will be very uncommon now, but again, this was focused on more on, on an explanation point of view. You are going to be looking at cross-site request forgery or CSRF. Now, this is an extremely important topic and uh, a big one that I cover it correctly. So for the purpose of this video, I've set up a very unique environment that in, at least in my opinion, will demonstrate how to utilize or how to perform this attack. All right, now I'm just going to give you a, a brief overview of the environment that I have. Now, of course, you can see I have a few files open here. Don't worry about them right now. Just uh, just remember that we'll be using them later on and I'll be using them really, really well to explain what's going on here. So you can see as my target or as my vulnerable uh, system, uh, I'm going to be using or my vulnerable web application, I should say. I'm going to be using the OASP juice shop now. Uh, not uh, actually no one actually re recommended this to me, but I remember that I performed this during a CTF challenge that I went to uh, earlier, I think late last year. Uh, I'm not too sure exactly when, but uh, the whole process was involved with exploiting this web application. All right. And in my opinion, this really outlined or really showed off how to perform all of these uh, various web application attacks. In this case, we're going to be focusing on cross site request forgery. All right, so I have the juice shop uh, running. It's uh, it's based on Node.js and it's running on my local host. Let me just show you that right now. There we are. So I haven't logged in or done anything yet and that's because I'm going to do that with you. So I've set it up, it's running on my local host. Let's get started with this really, really simple but sometimes uh, complicated topic. All right, so cross-site request forgery, CSRF. 
Now from the name you can already tell that it's split into two in, in, into two sections. You have your cross site and your request forgery. So from that we can get a, a basic example of what's going on here. We have cross site scripting and we are going to be forging requests or we are going to be manipulating requests. Hmm, interesting. So we, we are we are kind of understanding what's going on here. Now the technical explanation for what CSRF is is it is an attack that forces an end user to executed unwanted actions on a web application in which they are currently authenticated. All right, so let me put that really, really simply. All right, it's an attack that will force an end user to execute unwanted actions on a web, on a web application. These actions can be anything, but in this case, we're going to be looking at changing the password uh, and they have to be currently authenticated to that web application, which, which means they have to be logged in to that web application for this to work. Because if they're logged out, then you get the idea. It really doesn't help or it doesn't work. All right. So we use cross-site scripting in this case to perform the request forgery and to get either desired or undesired results. In our case, we're going to be looking at how to, uh, to change the password of any user that's logged into the, to this web application. And how will we, how will we be doing that? Well, uh, we are going to be using CSRF, but, uh, the first thing you need to understand is how an HTML form works. All right. And this is very important because, uh, first of all, a client will request a page from a server. All right. The server will then respond and give the, uh, the client the HTML form. The client will then send back uh, the the, uh, the form with the data back to the server. The server will then authenticate and authorize the user, and then will uh, will perform the requested action. Uh, and based on the request and the response, we are able to forge or to change the request and get a desired re response. If you're looking at it from an attacker's perspective, all right. So. Uh, the, the, the way CRS, CS, um, CSRF works, sorry about that, is the attacker will manipulate the victim into submitting the attacker's form data to the victim's web server, essentially, uh, essentially performing the, these, uh, these requests. In, the, in our case, as I've mentioned, it will allow us to change the password of any user on this web application. In this case, the OASP, uh, juice shop web application. All right. So now you might be asking, well, if I'm a bug bounty hunter or I'm, I'm practicing to become a bug bounty hunter, how do I go about finding this vulnerability? Well, that's a very good question. And that is the question you should be asking yourself when performing any uh, penetration test. Now, coming back to my environment, I'm running Burp Suite, the community edition. You, you'll just need the community edition for this one. We're not performing any advanced techniques here because we're essentially just changing uh, we're just going to be changing the requests to get our desired responses. But uh, once we move on to the advanced stuff, I'll then be using OASP Zap for our uh, attacks. All right. So keeping things really, really simple, uh, we uh, th the way to look for these vulnerabilities is to target the login pages, which we have right here. Uh, we then need to we can then create the account and log in. And then finally, we will be creating our own uh, our own script to perform the cross-site scripting and that will allow us to submit the data or if we send the URL to a, another user of this web application who is currently authenticated, it will allow the, it will allow us to make them change their password uh, and then we can log into their account. All right. So this uh, vulnerability is very common on sites with accounts, uh, you know, uh, sites that have emails, uh, passwords, and as you probably would have guessed, there are a lot of sites that utilize this functionality, but remember, most of the sites out there will be protected from this vulnerability. So it's up to you to find uh, these vulnerabilities. All right. So as I've mentioned, we'll be using OASP Juice Shop as our target. And the reason is, is because it will explain what I want to explain really, really well. All right. And we'll be using the Burp Suite Community Edition. Now, as you can see, I'm currently running the Burp Proxy. I'm not intercepting any traffic. If I open up Burp Suite, I'm not intercepting any traffic. If I go to the proxy uh, and intercept, I'm not intercepting anything. So uh, it's currently just, uh, I'm, I'm just going through the Burp proxy and all uh, traffic and data is being logged through the Burp proxy. So uh, when it comes down to this little data that I've saved here, I've already created an account. The reason I've done that is to save time because I don't want to explain everything about it. So I've, create, uh, I've created a user with the email of test at test.com. 
and a password of password. So really simple. Again, there's nothing really complicated here. And if you want, if you're wondering what exactly does this mean? Well, this is uh, a security uh, question with the answer. So the, the question was, uh, what's my favorite pet? And I wrote in dog. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't scare you into thinking that I've gone completely crazy. And then in here, we have the script that we'll be using uh, or we'll be utilizing to perform the CSRF uh, on the site. I'll get to this in a second. We don't need that right now. So uh, if I want to log in, I know that the uh, the email is test at test.com and the password is password. All right. So let me do that right now. We need to authenticate. Uh, so let me log in like so. And I'm going to hit test at test.com. All right. And I'm going to write the password, which is password. And I'm going to hit login. All right. And I don't want to save the password. And there you are. So I've logged in now. Now, as I said, this is very, this vulnerability works really, really well when you're talking about changing passwords, because as you can probably guess, an attacker would, would be looking to exploit this functionality. Because imagine if we were able to send a request, a get request to our target with the URL, uh, encoded URL. Of course, uh, we can also use link shorteners if we wanted to, to do that. And essentially, if they authenticated it, it will allow us to make them change their password simply by clicking on the link. Uh, changing their password to whatever we specify. All right. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing we need to do is we need to look at how the get requests are being sent. Uh, and we can do that using uh, burp. So uh, we are just going to change our password. So our current password is password. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change uh, my password into password. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, password one, two, three. And I'm going to repeat it. So password one, two, three, and I'm going to hit change. All right. So the password was successfully changed. Okay. Now let's look at how this was processed in burp uh, or how the request was sent in burp. So I'm going to go into burp uh, proxy and HTTP history, and I'm going to go all the way to the bottom. And as you can see, we have the get request right over here. Okay. So the get request is very interesting. You can see we have the get request and it's targeting the, uh, the following uh, URL. And these are the parameters. So change password. The current password is password, uh, new password, one, two, three, and we've repeated it. All right. So now let us perform the forgery here. So I'm going to send this in to the repeater. All right. So I'm going to click on repeater and in here we can manipulate the requests and see what responses we get. All right. In case you, uh, you did not know about that, but again, uh, let's start off really, really simply. So, uh, we are going to be working with the raw request. We don't want to work with individual parameters, although you could change it, but we are going to be manipulating the request entirely so that it performs what we want to do. All right. So what we can do first is we can test. So let's change. Uh, what if we were to change, um, the current password to something like, uh, let's see, test, let's change it to test. And then we hit go. You can see that the response we get is a is a 401 error, which means we are authorized to make that and it will give you the message right here. The current password is not correct. All right, that's good. That is good from a web application perspective, which means that this web application is performing validation and it's not going to allow us to, you know, to just go in and start manipulating any requests and making changes. So from a security perspective, the web application is doing really, really well. All right. What if I was to change the new password? Um, let me change this back to password to the current password, which is what we set. And I change the new password to password pass one, two, three. All right. And I hit go. Uh, again, we get another error. Again, the 401 unauthorized error telling us that uh, the new and repeated password do not match. So yes, the current password is correct. And uh, the, the only thing that we're getting an error is the new password and the repeated password are not correct. So interesting. What if we want to change the password into password one, two, three, and uh, we can repeat that again. So we want to confirm this. So password one, two, three, um, actually hold on. Uh, so I'm going to say, uh, password one, two, three, and now. Uh, let's see what this tells us. This should verify it, but, uh, let's see if this works. So you can see, yes, that does work. And we know that this works because that's what we did. That was the original request. But what if uh, we do not know the current password of the user? Remember, we're going to be targeting other users of this web application. So what if we get rid of, and this is very, very, uh, this is the way 
penetration testers go about it? What if we get rid of stuff? So what if we get rid of the current password? All right, and now essentially the get is targeting change password with the question mark here, uh, essentially requesting, and we are only entering the fields or parameters new and repeat. What if we do that and we change them to password one, two, three, uh, I mean pass one, two, three, and pass one, two, three. Let me hit go. You can see, yes, it does work. Uh, we get the 200, uh, the 200 response, which means everything was processed correctly. And we were able to get uh, a password that looks to be hash, uh, that looks to be hashed. Uh, and we got the email that we used. So yes, we do know that it is working. All right. So, uh, we know that, um, we know that this worked, but we need to confirm that this has worked. So we can do this by going back into our web application and uh, we can log out and we can try and log in again. So log in with our new password. So we're going to say test at test.com and our new password was pass one, two, three. Remember, we, we changed it earlier, but again, I was demonstrating that we, if we are to send this to our target, we need to specify to, to make sure that it will work without any pre-required information like their current password. So we've manipulated the re request there. So let's hit login and voila, you can see it does work. Excellent. All right. So this is a fantastic example of how, how CSRF can be utilized or how it can be, ex uh, how you can find vulnerabilities for it. All right. So this can allow us to change or update anyone's password, uh, uh, anyone's accounts password uh, that are currently logged into this web application. All right. So now what do we, what do we need to do? Well, we can, we can log in as we've already seen. We can log in. And, uh, once we've logged in, we can, uh, we can test to see if cross site scripting does work. Uh, and then of, of course, utilizing it throughout the web application is very important. So, we can run a simple cross-site script uh, attack to see if it will work on the search bar right here. So I'm going to type in script uh, and a simple one. So alert uh, just to test whether it works. And in the alert, we can say uh, hello, um, just something stupid. Hello world, you know, uh, that's and I can't even type, man. Come on world. And um, we have typed in the alert and we can finally close the script here. Script like so. And let's hit search. And voila, we can see that indeed cross-site scripting work, works, which means we can insert, uh, we can insert our, our get request inside a script and, and use a cross-site scripting to perform the CSRF. And now you can see them conjoining together cross-site scripting with request forgery. Okay. So we now need to create our custom script that will allow us to utilize the attack. And we will be using XML and HTTP. Now you might have seen this script right over here. Let me just minimize this and open up leafpad. You might have seen this script that I created. Now you can find many of these uh, CSRS scripts uh, online that utilize uh, different languages. In my case, I find the one that works the best is uh, the is the one that works with X, XML and HTTP and contains the GET request in here. Okay. Now uh, you can see that the GET request requires the URL in which we submit uh, the the parameters without the current password. So we need to go back into burp. And if I was to go back into proxy HTTP, um, uh, sorry about that HTTP, uh, we look to change the password there. So if we go back into, uh, sorry, uh, the repeater, and if we look at this now, uh, we can see that the URL is right over here. So that's the get request. So if we copy this, the local host, obviously, and we are not uh, using any current password field. So if we can do that really, really simply, you can see how this can be utilized really, really well. So what we need to do now is understand how the URL will be formatted. And of course, the web application is going to encode it. And I'll get to that in a second. So we need to copy this uh, URL right here. So I'm just going to copy the URL and we can edit our, our script. So HTTPS and we paste it in inside the URL. You can copy this script if you want to. Um, let's take a look at whether this script is formatted correctly. Uh, so get HTTP. No, that's not the way we want it. Let me get rid of the pre predetermined uh, uh, HTTP there. So HTTP localhost, it's hosted on my localhost uh, with the port 3000 node, node JS standard. Uh, and the, we want to change the password. The new password is pass one, two, three and repeat is pass one, two, three. You can change that to whatever you want. If you want to, uh, you know, play around with the script. Uh, but in my case, um, I don't want to do any of that. So this is the script. So what we can do is we can copy this now and uh, we can run this in uh, the search bar. 
uh, and that should uh, in theory and in practice give us our first CSRF attack on the site. So I'm going to paste this in here and let's see whether it does this. So I'm going to hit search and you can see you successfully solved, uh, solved a challenge. Error handling, uh, provoke an error that is not very gracefully handled. Again, this is a fantastic web application, vulnerable web application that is awesome for practicing your, your web application penetration testing skills. Now, I talked about the URL that you should send to your target. And that is the URL that will essentially make them change their password uh, without them knowing. Given that they are logged in to the web application or they have an account, it will not work if they've not logged in. All right. So that's very important to understand. And many people just, you know, forget about this. Now, again, uh, if you, you could have done this, uh, you, I can log out again and, uh, I can log in, try and log in now. And, uh, I can type in, for example, test. I just want to show you something very interesting here. Test. And I can change the password. Uh, we already changed it to password one, two, three. Now, before I do that, I can just inspect the element here and I'm going to hit login. And I just want you to check something out. All right. Now, let me just expand this a little bit here. Uh, if we were to look at the network, this will essentially show us all the get requests. So if I was to hit login, you can see uh, that uh, if we are to look at the get request here, the login get request, you can go ahead and look at um, at the exact format in which it was sent. You can look at the cookie. The It should give you the uh, the authentication token. I'm um, not too sure. It should give you the, authentic, the, the authentication token, but that's something for another day. I don't want to complicate you guys. You can look at the cookie if you want to, and you have all the responses right here. So there we are. There's the authentication token, and you can see something very interesting in regards to the token. All right, so let me show you this right now. All right, so uh, as I was saying, uh, you can see. All right, so uh, as I was saying, uh, you can see that if we look at the parameters, the password will be displayed there and it will be updated to the one that we selected or specified in the script. All right, so remember, if you want to customize the cross site scripting attack, you can do it through your script. And uh, where is leafpad here? So there we are. So you can change the password. Uh, the As you see, we, we just got rid of the current password parameter which is a vulnerability on the site, but you can change the password to whatever you want. And now you might be asking, as I've mentioned, what link do you send to the target? And that is very, very simple. If I was to run the script again, and I change the password to maybe something else like uh, password one, two, four, or three, four, five, sorry, three, uh, four, five. Let me just add that to the password. And I run the script uh, on uh, an authenticated user, which is me. Uh, so let me copy that. And it should change my account password. And you can see once I log out, uh, log out and try logging in, it will have changed it successfully. So let me just run it in here. Uh, so I'm going to paste the new one in here and I'm going to search. And there we are. So now it's changed my password. And if I log out and I try and log in with, with the old password, which is uh, password one, two, three, you can see, whoops, sorry, I think I typed that in wrongly. One, two, three, like so. If I log in, there we are. You can see that we entered the new password and it did work. Fantastic. So we were successfully able to execute the script. And again, when if I just run the script again, this is the URL that you will send to your target. All right. So if I just copy it and I inspect it in my leafpad here, uh, I really love leafpad. I don't know whether you guys love it too. If I just inspect it, you can see that this indeed is a URL. And if the web application was being hosted on a server outside my local air network, it would give you the website name, the port, if it is port specific and the URL here, which as you can see is encoded. So what I would recommend is that you copy this link here and you use a link shortener like Bitfly or any of the other Google shorteners and you send that to your target. And once they click on the link and if they already logged in to this specific web application, it will update their password and you can essentially, uh, you have their password now because you've updated it and you all, all you need is their email, which I'm pretty sure you must be knowing if you're performing this attack or you could just be gathering passwords of users or, or of, of which you can, uh, you can send this link to and are authenticated with the web application. We're going to be taking a look at session management and uh, uh, in this video particularly, we'll be looking at cookie collection. 
All right. So as you know, uh, you probably would have known what a cookie is. Now, there are three types of cookies that we really need to be focusing on uh, in this section and uh, we'll be focusing on in general. The first one is the session cookies, which uh, I'll discuss in a while. We then have the permanent cookies and the third party cookies. So uh, third party cookies are really all to do with uh, third party APIs that may be used. So for example, if you're on a website that utilizes Flash Player, you may find some cookies uh, that um, uh, th that are in, in relate uh, that are related to the Flash Player. So it's very important that you understand how to co collect these cookies. And as well, we'll be looking at reverse engineering them, but not really tampering with them because of, I first want to explain to you guys how everything is done. And then we can move on into, um, into finally tampering with them and seeing if we can change them to, to give us access, to give us different type of, of access. And where this comes into play is when you're talking about session cookies. Uh, and in the session uh, cookies, we have the, uh, the, auth the authentication token and the, de uh, and the unauthenticated token. So, uh, all to do with your access on a web application or on a website. Okay. So, um, essentially uh, all the cookies that you can probably ever get when you visit, uh, uh, you, you get when you visit a website, uh, they are generated when you visit the website. And, uh, furthermore, the cookies change when you authenticate with the website and you, uh, or you log out. All right. So when you log in, you get a different set of cookies and when you log out you get a different set of cookies this is where the whole idea of session management comes into play and how cookies are utilized for this system so uh, i'm currently running oasp's due shop uh, so i showed you guys how to set that up uh, let me know if you found it helpful so i have it set it up and i open i have it open up in my browser now what i'm going to be covering is how to collect these cookies and understanding the difference between an unauthenticated cookie and uh, the authenticated cookie so uh, usually uh, uh, what i have uh, or what i use to my advantage is if you're using google chrome or firefox you you can get a cookie uh, collection or a cookie editor add-on that allows you to edit the cookies but as i said we're not going to be looking at editing them right now because we don't know what to change in them this video is going to be focused on collecting them and then analyzing them to see what information they have within them all right, so I'm, I've currently, I reset this, um, the uh, OWASP juice shop. And the reason I did that is just to start off fresh. And I said, we're going to be using this uh, for performing all of the examples that I'll be showing you so that we can learn all the concepts. So I'm just going to, uh, but before we log in, I just want to show you the first set of cookies that we'll get once we, well, when we've visited the site. Uh, don't worry about the other links. We'll get to them in a second. All right, so I'm using the cookie editor right here. You can find uh, this same one for Firefox. That's what I'm using. There are also other ones for uh, Google Chrome, if you want to do that. And in addition, we're not going to be using any proxy uh, like Burp Suite or the OWASP Zap right now because we're just focused on using the browser tools and, of course, these add-ons here. Uh, so what I can do now is if I just go right-click and I hit Inspect Element, we have uh, the... Um, the developer tools right here and uh, if we are to go into once you've installed the cookie editor you can directly go into storage and in storage you'll you'll be give, you'll get the cookies here and uh, other values right here but if you uh, it'll be better uh, for you to understand what's going on if you go into the cookie editor now in the cookie editor you can see that uh, we have two cookies that we've gathered here and we have the cookie consent status and uh, the uh, the io which i'm not sure really uh, what it does uh, input output uh, output I'm probably guessing so when it comes down to the cookie consent status we probably get an idea of what uh, of what this is uh, of what this is asking us so when I when I opened up the website it gave me a prompt asking me like all websites will ask you uh, in 2018 to do is to accept their privacy policy uh, in their privacy policies in regards to uh, their use of personal data and cookies and the reason is is because cookies can uh, can log or have a lot of information about you they contain a lot of information about what you what you've been doing so this is why i've uh, created this uh, right now before we move along it's very important to understand their role in session management okay so we need to look at uh, the authentic uh, the, the authentication tokens because that's where uh, most of the magic happens as you would expect so let me just close this up and let me just log in so let me just use the password there the email that i used and the password uh, like so and let me just log in 
I don't want to save the password. So I've logged in now and if I inspect the element again, you can see in the cookie editor, uh, let that load. It usually takes a while to load. There we are. We have the token. Now the token, this token is an authentication token. All right. So when it comes down, um, when it comes down to reverse engineering a, a token, for example, let's use this as our example. We're essentially testing it for vulnerability, similar to a penetration test. Now you might be a little bit confused. You might be asking, well, what, what, what do you mean by this? How can we perform a penetration test on this token? Well, this token, is encoded all right so this is uh if we just copy this uh, i i don't know whether you know about this but this is a json web token all right so it is it is a json web token and you can use the json web token decoder i'll be posting this link in the description this is the one that i prefer to use uh if i am to paste this in here and uh you can see once i've pasted it in here it's going to give me all information and I'm going to help you understand what we've do just done. So essentially what we have done is we have reverse engineered what this web token is all about. So now we need to look at what, co what it contains and what type of uh, authorities or privileges it's giving uh, to us. Because remember, this is an authentication token and it is unique to us because this will, uh, this will determine whether or not we are logged into a site or we're logged out and what access we have on the website. I'm pretty sure you already know that. All right. So. When it comes to the header, now this is very important. I've seen many web uh, people claiming to be bug bounty hunters and they don't understand how the, the web token is even structured. What is the header? The header is separated from the payload. This is the header right here. Up until the first full stop, that is the header. It's very important to understand that because they are separated from each other. In fact, the JSON web token is sorted into three parts right here. You have the, you have the header, you then have the payload until here, and then finally, you have the signature, which is right, uh, right at the bottom here, which is also separated from the rest. Okay. So when it comes down to the header, all right, the header is going to give you the type of the, uh, of the token. In, in this case, we know it's a JSON web token. We then have the algorithm, which is the hashing algorithm used, uh, which is, uh, the RS-256 and then the payload. Now in the payload, this is where things get really interesting, as you would have expected. You have the status, uh, the status code here, the data, if any data was passed, the ID. We can always use the ID uh, to, we, we can always edit the ID to see what else it can give us in terms of authentication because different types of identification uh, or identification tokens give us different types of access. So as essentially this is what I was talking about. This is where you will scrutinize the, uh, the, the authentication token and try and, and tamper with it to, to, to see what different results you can, you can get. So remember, we can edit this token, all right? And we can edit anything about it. And then we can finally copy it and, uh, we can use that, uh, in the OS view shop and paste it right here and re-authenticate with that new token and see what results we can get. Now, of course, we are not going to do that right now because I wanted to introduce you as to what information you're going to find and what exactly is going on here. Okay. So one step at a time. So. Uh, you can see that something interesting props up here. Something extremely interesting. We have the email, which for some reason in this token, we can see that it's not very well designed because the email is in plain text, which means, which means if in, 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 in any case or in any scenario, someone is, is able to get this token, uh, in which I authenticated with in a site, they will have access to my email and my password. But you must be saying, well, I didn't see you type out all of these random passwords here. Well, I can easily guess that this is an MD5 uh, hashed password, which means I can, depending on the, uh, on the strength of the password, I can decrypt online in a second using any of the decryption tools. So if I was to just copy this right now, and I wanted to know the password, let's say this wasn't even mine, this authentication token wasn't even mine. And I found the, uh, the email and password. All I needed to do was unhash the password. I can go to md5online.org, which is what I use a lot. And I paste that hash right in here and I hit decrypt. And you can see, well, first of all, it's going to prompt me to enter a capture here, storefront. Uh, this is, this is getting really annoying now. Uh, for some reason, it always does that. As you can see, it's going to, it's going to find the hash. Now, of course, this is, this is dependent on the difficulty of the hash and whether or not it can find it online. 
Okay, so you can see that the, it will display the hash and the password in plain text, which in this case was pass123. Now, of course, you can experiment with this and you can also experiment if, for example, the authentication token that you found was using a different uh, encryption uh, or a hashing algorithm for the password. The first thing you need to do is identify what it's using and then you go about decrypting it. Now, uh, I'm not going to be talking about the other parts here because that's a bit... Um, that's a bit advanced and as you can see by default the signature uh, the, the token signature failed which means we can tamper with this token and we can make changes to it and we can authenticate with it because as I said the OASP view shop is uh, is designed to be vulnerable and this is where you perform all of these tests. Okay, so when it comes down to the payload, the most important things are to look for the status, the ID, and obviously if you can get any other information in the data section or in, in terms of the email and the password, that's also very important. Now, of course, it's not very easy to get uh, a hold of someone's um, of someone's token, but you can do it, but, uh, and uh, then you are performing the, the penetration test on the token because if someone was to write in the comment section of this video, what if I was to grab the, uh, the authentication token that belongs to Facebook? Let's say I had access to someone's computer for a few seconds, uh, and I was to get the authentication token. What would I be able to do? Well, first of all, you have to test the security of that token. And I can guarantee you that their tokens are going to be very well secured and performing the penetration, uh, the penetration test on them will be a different ball game. So we'll be looking at changing them or, or tampering them to give us different types of access. We're going to be talking about HTTP attribu attributes and cookie security. I am currently running OS View Shop, and what I did is I started a fresh new instance. So I unzipped a new OS View Shop. Uh, that's because I wanted to start afresh. Now, of course, in the previous video we looked at cookie analysis and tokens, but now we're going to look at how uh, at the security aspect of how these cookies are secured and how uh, you know how cookies are stolen and how these can be exploited with um, with uh, with other exploits or functionality like cross-site scripting. Now you'll, you'll, you'll get to what I'm saying in a few seconds. So I have OS View Shop uh, running and I've created uh, the same user and password as I did last time. So it's uh, test at test.com, that being the email and the password is password123, just sh uh, so you know. And I'll do that right now. I'm just gonna log in. As you can see, test at test.com and the password is password123. So let me just log in and there you are. So uh, I've logged in and I haven't solved any challenges. So when we talk about uh, cookie security, what do I mean? Well, this can be done or can be inspected really easily. Now, of course, for this, you're not going to need any of the uh, browser extensions or add-ons because we'll just simply just be inspecting the element here. So if we open inspect element and go into storage and we go into cookies and select uh, the, the site, which is on localhost, you can see that if I was to click on, for example, the token, uh, and we j just look at the data, uh, you know, that we can see within the token. Uh, if we go to the HTTP only uh, section here, you can see that that is set to false. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that we can potentially exploit uh, this cookie and its storage location in the sense that it is it is uh, it is not secured. Now, I'll get to why and how this is happening in the in a few seconds. All right, so. Uh, if the value is set to false, it means that the cookie can be accessed and written to. Now, how can one use this, you know, for potential attacks or cookie uh, cookie stealing as we know it? Now, if you are uh, an advanced uh, web application penetration tester and you know about cross-site scripting, you know that usually attackers will use cross-site scripting to steal cookies by sending you links uh, that then uh, you know, uh, by sending you links to pages on the site that, that you're already authenticated to uh, that uh, have the, uh, the the malicious JavaScript code that will then send your cookie, your authentication cookie with your token, etc., etc., to their attack server. And from that, they can then use that to authenticate into your account. It's not common because mostly uh, the the cookies are usually secured. Now, you will run into sites that have this, and this is a very, very big vulnerability in terms of severity. So if you are a bug bounty hunter, this is in the medium to low category. So not really a big exploit, but still, 
uh, a very very uh, a big problem that many many you know uh, usually i would like to say rookie developers miss especially when dealing with huge frameworks like node etc i'm not going to get too deep into that so you can see that the http only is set to false now what does this mean this means that we can use uh, utilize a lot of functionality to exploit or to display the the token or even more to send this the uh, my cookie or you know my token whatever you want to call it to an, a server or to save it all right to grab it to steal it uh you know simply put so uh how can we exploit this well we can use cross site scripting and this is probably the most used uh um, method for this and uh to do this we can simply uh we can use any of the uh we can use the search or we can use the contact uh, but i like using search because usually it is unfiltered now when i say this i'm you know many of you will say well most of the big sites well i'm not talking about the big sites the big sites obviously have to take this into consideration i'm talking about sites that are developed by small teams they usually don't take this into consideration so uh, if i was to just type in uh, a simple um, cross site scripting uh, script that will essentially display my cookie right now as i'm authenticated so to do that i'll just type in script and uh for this we're using an alert here to display to us so alert and uh we're going to say document whoops stop, sorry document dot cookie and um and then we're going to just close the script like so so this will display our cookie to us not really helpful but you can imagine if we were to uh have this permanently posted for example as a post here and then whenever we send that link to someone and they click on it we can customize this javascript code to send uh their cookie to our web server and once we get their cookie you basically know what's going to happen there so if i hit enter to search you can see that uh it's going to display our cookie and our token uh and uh, this is extremely dangerous you might not get the context but i'll explain it in a second so essentially this information can be passed and sent anywhere across the world provided that the that, that your target clicks clicks on a link in which this this script is executed now The question that you might be asking yourself was well where else can we post this in in sort of a malicious way and I know that I sound malicious right now but I'll also get into how to mitigate this and again mitigating it is really simple just set your http status or your http attribute to true uh, or set it to on uh, essentially securing your cookie now uh you can see that once we have this you saw in the previous video what we could do with such information and what info it contains in regards to the user and how we can uh we can you know crack the password but for now let's focus on how this can be utilized to steal the cookie or how attackers do it so uh you you can also get insight if you're a white hat so usually i can post this in here i can put, you know i can type the script in here but this is not it's probably not the best way of doing it because you essentially have to convince the user to go into the search bar and type this in not really the best of ways about going uh, you know about going about this so usually we look for a page that that allows us to um, you know to post our own stuff or to save this to a database or to save it to the website itself so we let's try contact us all right so contact us uh, yeah that looks like a good place to start so in the comment you, it's already added our author for us so in the comment we can enter we can enter our script in here and this will probably probably be saved but we have to test it now of course uh, the cookie stealing javascript code is not something that i'm going to be telling you how to do you can probably perform a lot of google searches it's part of the the terms that i have to follow uh, in regards to youtube's uh, youtube's policies about uh malicious content uh and when what not so i'm not going to show you the exact code but i'll probably have it on my website if you want to take a look at it and experiment as to how to send cookies to another server a server that belongs to you for example um so uh to do this so now essentially what i want to do is i want to save this script uh into their contact section because i believe this is saved if i looked uh, i looked at the structure and indeed this is saved so uh the script is quite simple so we can say uh we can give it a title because i know the feedback is is left like that um so we can say script test and um we can close the script here so script uh but then we have to include the uh the actual javascript code so yeah so let's include this script within the main one so script and then uh once we close this one we can then use the other script so yeah script 
oops script in you you can copy this code if you want by the way let me just zoom in because a lot of you had actually talked to me about that that you couldn't actually see the code so uh script and um now we want to bring up the alert now of course as i said this is not really useful because all you're doing is displaying the cookie to the user themselves once they visit this page so you 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 probably get the idea um so script um alert and uh we are just simply just going to write the document now, of course if i was sending it to a malicious server what i would have done is i would have used the document dot cookie and i would have appended it to be sent in in the form of uh, probably a php file or a php get request to my server and then my server would log all of the the information being sent back so that's the concept there behind so we can then close the script here uh and sorry we have to actually close the script um uh, oops sorry my bad and then we close the script there and finally we can close the final script ending here so script and there we are and we can leave a rating if we want to and there is a a capture here or authentication 10 plus 5 uh you 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 basically have, this is also an exploit here that you can enter because if you look at this very, very basically from a simple perspective the capture here is again is another false positive and again i know i'm dragging this uh, uh i'm dragging it a, a lot but but what i'm trying to explain here is if you are going to if you are going to be performing a penetration test on a website you you need to understand that uh from the perspective of false positives you should not go after the big exploitations or the big exploits first all right so if i submit this uh, as i know the structure of the OASP view shop this will be submitted to one of the pages in which after i click or any other user who is authenticated clicks will will run that script or this script and will the, the their cookie will be displayed on their screen and if you want to uh, manipulate or use your own script to send their cookie to to your server uh, by all means go and do that i'm not condoning it so uh, that is 75 and i hit submit and what that's the wrong capture 10 plus 5 actually 25 uh yes brackets of division multiplication addition you guys must be thinking i suck at maths so that is 25 plus 5 uh plus 10 sorry that's 35 35 and i submit that uh, oops we have to actually type our code back in sorry about that guys uh so we can just type in script and we're simply testing test and then after this we can close the first one and uh script here oops sorry about that my keyboard is quite of a distance from me um alert and um, my spelling mistakes are really annoying script and finally we can use the document um my god man my typing document dot alert uh, dot cookie sorry we, are, we have already sent the alert uh we would use the doc document dot alert would essentially display the entire web page document dot cookie and in here we close the first script uh and uh sorry the the initial script and then we close the last one here so script um and we close that right there and finally we can give this a rating and we submit and that should submit it uh i don't know what the issue is here and then there we are was well, for some all right so there we are thank you for your feedback so it did submit it there uh, let me zoom back out now uh, you can see that uh, where would you go to launch this script that's um, that that will be the question that you might be asking so on this in this structure you can pretty much experiment with all the other pages and again i do recommend that you use uh, you know directory discovery tools like derbuster or gobuster whatever is is comfortable for you so uh, with this in mind if uh, first to just click on about us you can see that that is where the the, um, the feedback in regards to contact is stored. So there you are. There's the cookie, and if I was to, if I was to have uh, implemented a script that would send the cookie to my server once I accessed this page as an authenticated user, uh, it would send my my session ID, all of that good stuff uh, to my web server, and I would be able to crack the password. And authenticate with your account as simple as that without ever knowing your password without ever trying to have guessed it without without ever trying to have exploited your system i exploited the web application and because of the the inability of the developer of the web application to secure the cookies i was able to get into your account and uh, god knows what else you can do in that person's account 
And uh, this is, you know, this is tribute to my, all my Facebook hacker friends out there who think hacking Facebook is is about cracking and brute forcing. Uh, there you go. You know, web applications can can be cracked in uh, or can be exploited in different ways. Now, of course, as I said, it's going to get really exciting as we move along with Dew Shop, and that's the reason I'm using it because it 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 explains how this can be done on a real website, and uh, yeah. We're going to be looking at OWASP Juice Shop, and it seems to replicate what a real web application would be. A fairly poorly designed one, but uh, the thing I like about it is it has varying lev uh, levels of difficulty, and that's really, really awesome. I have it set up on Heroku, as you can probably see right over here, and that works perfectly fine for me because I, you know, I wanted to set it up really quickly. I don't want to run it on my local server, you know, using Node or Docker. Um, that's really is, uh, I really didn't have the time to do that. But if you want to, you can, uh, you can use Heroku and it should be free for you. Uh, so yeah, definitely go ahead and give it a try. And you should have a, an instance set up for yourself so you can go ahead and do it. And it's giving us a prompt here telling us that this website uses fruit cookies. To ensure you get the juiciest tracking experience. Now, from my experience, uh, I would hit accept uh, the cookies because essentially that's what keeps track of your progress. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's pretty. That should be quite good. Now, as for my browser, I'm using the latest version of Firefox, and uh, I have you know plugins or add-ons like Cookie Editor, and uh, that's pretty much what we'll be needing in this video. I hope. And we don't have the uh, the proxies here, like um, sorry, Foxy proxy to allow us to use uh, things like Burp Suite or Zap, whatever you want to use. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Now, the first challenge, as I believe, is to get the um, the scoreboard, and we should start from there. And uh, to do this, I think I have done this already. That's really very simple. All we need to do is well, first of all, before we actually do that, uh, the interface is quite simple. It is a juice shop as you probably can see and could have understood. And they sell juice. Now, the great thing that I like about OWASP Juice Shop is that this replicates a real life uh, web application with, you know, security misconfigurations, etc., etc. So if I hit login, you have your login page right over there and you can create a, a new account if you want to. You can search. We have a contact us page that allows us to, you know, essentially contact uh, whoever is behind the site and we have an about us page. And the thing I like about this is, as I said, it replicates what I would call a real web application. Now, when we talk about um, about the scoreboard, I think that can be accessed really, really quickly uh, by going into scoreboard like so. So, you know, we can just hit scoreboard uh, and if I hit enter, that should give us the scoreboard. All right. So it gives us the notification uh, once you've completed a challenge. And the reason it does this is to notify you of your progress. Remember, this can be considered a capture the flag type of challenge, but I wouldn't call it this. I, I think this is fantastic for essentially explaining the concepts here. All right, so let me explain how the scoreboard is essentially works. All right, so your scoreboard is as follows. Sorry about that if you heard my phone. It always seems to do that. So we have uh, we have the challenges sorted in terms of difficulty. So we have uh, a one star, two star, three star, four star, five star, and six star, and they all have various challenges within them. So for example, the the difficulty is sorted in terms of stars. So you get the idea. One star is quite easy. Two stars, uh, you know, not so easy. We have three stars. Things are getting a bit sweaty here. Four stars. Now we're talking. Five stars. I'm banging my head on the wall. And six stars, uh, that's going to take you probably a few a few days or, you know, hours, depending on your determination. All right, so you can see it also give you the, gives you the challenge names here. So if I click on uh, the two star challenges, you can go ahead and look at the challenges there. And we pro I think in the previous videos, we covered a lot of the two star and three some of the four star challenges. That's what I wanted to go through. So the three star challenges are where things get really awesome because it tells you to start logging in with... Uh, other users, and there's a bit of cross-site scripting. I'm not going to go through all of that. Uh, let's start off with what we can do. All right, so the first challenge in the first star uh, is access the administration section of the store. All right, so I'm guessing we have to try and log in. Now, I think I've done this. This is the first challenge. Uh, we have to access a confidential document, uh, provoke an error that is not gracefully, very gracefully handled. 
not too sure what that is let us redirect you i'll try and cover as many as i can in one video we have a cross-site scripting attack this was simple i think we covered this so yeah we can pretty much run that in in one of these right over here so script and alert as it already gives you hints these are very very easy so you can just say test uh have i given the uh, oops sorry my bad so yeah there we are test uh and uh we close that up and we also close the script right over here and we hit enter and uh, there we are so that is one of the challenges solved hopefully it did pop up there so if we go back to the scoreboard um it still tells us well for some reason the web application is too low it's not told us that we have performed a reflected cross-site scripting all oh, those are dom all right so reflected anyway we'll get to that when we get to it so if we inspect the login page uh, what we can do is we can create a user. So I'm going to create a user here and I'll just use a simple user here called test at test.com and the password I'll call that password and I'm going to repeat the password here and uh, I'll just call the password password and I'm just going to use uh, uh, name of your favorite pet and I'm just going to say dog right over here. I'm going to hit register and I'm just going to save that. All right, so I can log in now. Uh, did I log in with the correct test? Uh, yeah, there we are. And I'm going to hit log in and uh, we are logged in. All right. So let me just zoom out. So the interface does not uh, really crash on us. Let me just get rid of that. All right. So uh, it's sorted out really well. We have the language selector here, your basket, which essentially allows you to select your um, uh, to, to view the items in your basket. Uh, you then have your coupon if you want uh, if you want to use a coupon and you have your checkout which essentially I believe takes you to the the OS juice shop uh, donate page if I'm not wrong um, let's just see if that is correct yeah uh, you so if you want to support the project uh, I would rec you, you know you can donate to them it's it's a really great project I really do recommend that if you can you do so uh, so you can change your password, uh, which is awesome. I think we also took a look at this and how to change it using um, uh, using the get requests. Uh, contact us where you can essentially write in, you can contact the, uh, the person behind the site or the administrator, as I would believe. Uh, you can comment, uh, recycle, recycle, what's this? Request a recycling box. So you can type in liters here. That has a selector um all right uh okay that's not too bad we have a complaints board uh, and the scoreboard itself here which for some reason keeps doesn't really load so let's try and work on the first section as i mentioned i'll try and cover as much as i can here and you have the about us here that has some sort of a um let's see some sort check out our boring terms of use uh, let me just check the scoreboard. What exactly are we supposed to do? Because access the administration section. Uh, what's in the two star here? Login with the administrator. All right. So we're trying to access the administration section. Um, so let's try and access that right over here. So I'm just going to type in uh, administration like so. I'm going to hit enter. And yeah, that was pretty easy. And we get the email right over here. Admin and juice shop. Um, that's the admin email and we have all the emails right over here so we have jim at juice uh juice shop uh bender and some other users and we have our so yeah all right so uh we got the uh, registered users customer feedback uh and the recycling requests that have been posted so far uh, which means we're starting from ba the basics so i think we can try and log in with admin but we don't know the password so yeah so i'm just gonna log out and uh, let's see if we can uh, log in with the password here uh admin at juice shop and uh i probably i'm probably guessing we have to use sql injection and in this case i think i know what to do because i have done this before but it has been changed quite a bit since the last time because i think in the previous versions it was with admin only there was no domain or was their username i'm not too sure Anyway, uh, let's try and see if we can throw some errors here. Uh, so if I log in, uh, all right, so that means you have to provide a password. So let me just try and use the single quotation and let's see if that, yeah, it does throw an error. And yeah, yeah, we completed the other challenge, which you successfully solved the challenge, error handling, provoke an error. So yeah, so we're essentially performing error enumeration. If that's something you've never heard of, it's essentially where you just try and 
see how the oh it's fuzzing really just throwing uh you know information at the system seeing how it responds uh and we get here the query yeah so we are performing sql injection because as you can see it tells us here we have the um the query right over here which is telling us select uh and what this is saying is select all entries from the user table where emails are equal to and we specified the single quotation uh, and the password is what is this this looks like a hash uh, what hash is this let me just check i think it might be md5 i'm not too sure let me just check this hash uh, identifier and we just paste that in there sorry about that let me just paste that in there yeah this is a md5 hash so uh, that probably let's just see if we can decrypt that or decode that so i'm just going to say md5 uh decryptor or something like that let's just see if we can do this online really really quickly come on come on i want to see what error because that's telling us that's a password uh let's decrypt that and uh well for some reason it's taking too much time here uh, so yeah, yeah, it's essentially hashing the password. All right, interesting stuff there. We actually now know that the password is being hashed, uh, obviously, you know, with the MD5 hashing algorithm or protocol, whatever you want to call it. So original and yeah, that is the query statement there. So we can try some basic uh, SQL injection uh, and uh, ba some of the basic ones to log in to admin or to essentially yeah log into the administration um, the admin panel is now the thing that's weird is are we going to use the password here yeah, we're trying to get authentication so that means let me just close that um, that means if we just throw the error one more time or get the when you're able to get the query here so we're saying select actually it starts from there select from users so select all queries or all entries from the user table from where email user table so there's users all right so the user uh, the user table has email and password okay i follow now uh so that means we can try we can try um we can try and use the or statement here and probably we can use the not statement if we are going to yeah that will make a lot of sense but we're only using email so we'll keep the single quotation so what that means is is if you know about sql injection hopefully i can explain what's going on here uh so we know that the password is being hashed so we're saying select from the table where email and password uh so that's the statement so select uh, from the table for so, so sort of select from the users table where the email and password is going to be equal to um is going to be equal to what we have entered but remember the the password has to be has to stay as the single quotation so that means yeah we, we are going to be using the or so this is basic uh you, you guys should be knowing this but if you want me to cover it let me know so or equals uh, so or one equals one and the other uh, other ways of doing this um i think i'll post a cheat sheet in the description section you can check it out for yourself just to get up to to scratch with what's happening here so what we're saying is we're using the or the or uh, the syntax of or is very simple it's where we have the uh what's happening here is we are saying uh we're saying okay so, so you if you know the syntax for how a query is made in S sql it's really very simple so we're saying select from uh from the table we're, remember this is specifying a table not a column so it says select from the users table uh from uh select from the users table email password so we're comparing and then we say all oh, and then we specify the condition where the value we can enter are in two fields so we can say the value of the email can always be changed uh, and we obviously know that that is the first account that was created and the password is going to remain the same so we hit log in and uh, yeah we get still keep on getting an error here now that is weird now because if i specify there is no comment here or one equals one yeah so it is working so you can see so select uh, from users where one equals one and password uh yeah so we want to nullify and password we don't want and there so for that we use the we use a comment here 
uh, and there we are excellent so we're able to log in uh, to the administrator's user account all right so let me explain what happened there so as i said the the syntax or the query was as follows so we're selecting um from the users table we're selecting the email and password and comparing them to each other so they have to match so we're, we're performing a query a simple query and what we said is or that's a conditional statement so we're saying or uh, that we specify the condition where the first value is going to be equal to the, the 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 first one is going to be equal to one and we nullify the uh the password where the password we so essentially removing authentication and we are what because we're including the comment syntax for sql all right so that was pretty simple but now the thing that's bothering me is we don't have the password so let me just check the scoreboard here and let's see what progress we've made so far uh so we've access the administration section that's not in here that is in here so log in uh, with the administrator's user account but i don't know what the password is so i think that's how we're going to be logging in uh we know the email because if i just go back into administration here uh, administration uh, i hope the video is not getting too long so we have the admin uh, we have the admin email here um Oh, yes, 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 yes. We have the token. So if we inspect the element uh, and we go into the cookie editor, for example, we can use that or you can just use storage. Well, I should have done it, you know, from the cookie editor from the beginning. So we have the uh, the token here. And I talked about this in my other video. I actually went through this with the token. So, uh, so we're going to say token. I think the site was, it's a JSON token. So token decode. Uh, and it should be the first site. Yeah, there, JSON Web Tokens. So JWT.io, that's an excellent site. And we talked about this. Uh, so if you want to watch that video, I'll post it in the description. So you can check it out. And uh, the email is admin. So that's the authentication token. And that gives us all the information we need. All right, so we have the password here. But again, what is this hashed into? That looks like MD5 again, but let me just confirm and let's see what that gives us. So the password is hashed as we know with MD5. So let's just confirm um, hash identifier because uh, there we are. Yeah, it is MD5. So let's just decrypt that one more time. Um, so I'm just going to paste in that hash there. I'm just going to decrypt. Um, let's give that a few seconds. Oh my God, man, all the traffic lights. Um, and let's hit verify and yeah there we are the password is admin123 yeah that's that's pretty basic but again replicating common practice that you would find so what was the email oh boy what was the email let me just see and blog back oh crack all right so let me just use the statement so yeah we so we're logging in so uh, or one equals one because we're, well, what is the I think we can access the uh, the email from the administration. Sorry about that, guys. I know I'm getting really mixed up. Uh, well, we're not logged in yet. So ah, anyway, let me just log in uh, and we can do the administration here. Administration and uh, the admin at juice shop uh, at juice shop uh, at juice sh dot op. Yeah, that's there to confuse people so you can guess it. Uh, and we're logging in with that and the password is admin123 I'm gonna log in and yeah fantastic so you solved a challenge password strength uh, so that was the problem there that that's the vulnerability that they're trying to say exists so you know again password strength is something that people don't take into account log in with administrator user credentials without previously changing them or applying SQL could you have done this with SQL injection probably I'll have to cover SQL injection because, you know, SQL injection is one of those things that's really dependent on the query. Um, so let me just go back to the scoreboard here. Um, I don't understand what else is left. There's still a lot of stuff that I have to cover. I talked about cross-site scripting, but I think I'll cover that in the next video. I'll explain it again. Um, what is the, um, what is the, uh, the confidential document? uh error handling well we don't have anything much there access someone else's basket i did that uh what else should i want to cover here uh, let's look at these ones right over here so yeah so we, the authentication area here is where i want to look at 
uh, I think that's what I'm going to end this video. I know I haven't covered any advanced stuff, but hopefully that's like an introduction. So we, where we have been able to log into the administrators in the administrators account. Uh, we were able to get the scoreboard, the administration panel. Uh, what else were we able to do? Uh, we were able to provoke an error. Not so, you know, nothing really complex there. And uh, we were able to uh, log in with the uh, administrator, uh, the administrators cre user credentials. Uh, we looks like we can actually get access to MacSafe search original users credentials. So again, another user that we can try and get access into. Yeah, that's going to be it for this video, guys. If you found value in this video, please leave a like down below. If you have any questions or suggestions, let me know in the comment section on my social networks or on my website. And I'll be sure to leave your reply. And I'll be seeing you in the next video. Peace, guys.